the event of the year. This is Ixan public lecture, part of our CSR commitment to bring in topical issues of national interest to the forefront. And it's my pleasure to welcome every one of you. As the foremost professional body, we should also respect the time of people. And that is why we want to start off. There is an excellent time. It's always the right time. And that we're going to do it. And we're hoping that Nigeria as a whole will learn from what we're going to do here. You are welcome. Thank you very much. Before we commence the session, I want to invite um, some members uh, who are going to play different roles in today's event. Uh, first of all, and very importantly, I want to invite to the stage, cheers up there, our own very president, the president of the Institute of Charter Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, Mr. Taiwo Benga Owokalade, FCISR. You are welcome. Please, the, can we? You are welcome, sir. Thank you. To help us provide direction in this meeting, we equally have a unique gentleman, a senior advocate of Nigeria and of the masses, a social activist and a warrior who have now moved to the other side and is now sitting in with the government. We are talking of no other person but Mr. Festus Kayamo, S.A.N. He is the Honorable Minister of State for Labor and Employment. Uh, he will be joining us online, but he is physically represented here by his special advisor, Mr. Da uh, Dave Olua. You are welcome, sir. Please come up this way. Please, let's still give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. If you scan the environment and you want to find out those who have contributed extensively to the topic that we are going to discuss today, you will find no better voice than that of our keynote speaker today. Ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome Professor Bongo Adi, our keynote speaker for today. Prof, you are welcome. We are going to introduce him more formally, and uh, you are welcome, sir. Thank you. As we are well aware, the last couple of years have told us that with technology, almost nothing is impossible. Our next, uh, um, uh, next discussant is currently with us online, and is no other person but Mrs. Toyin Sonny. FCIS. She's currently at Kigali for an assignment, but she has joined us online. You are welcome. Ma. Thank you very much. The last person I will bring up to this stage will be the other discussant, as you can see from the program. He is the GM Litigation, Property and Environmental Law Department at the NMPC, which is intrinsically connected to the topic of today. Ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome Mr. Rufai Kalib, ACIS. Okay? He will be joining us. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to uh, um, welcome present here our amiable vice president of Ixan. She's no other person but my own Mrs. Ekundayo. You are welcome. Uh, thank you very much. We also have guests, uh, special guests here, and I want to uh, introduce them briefly and ask them to come to the seats prepared for them. I want to specially welcome Hajia Ireti Kingibe. Hajia Ireti Kingibe, she will be joining us. Equally, we are also welcoming the DG 
of SEC, Dr. Lamido Yuguda, as well as the DG, CAC, Alaji Abubakar Alaji. They will join us, we will recognize them accordingly. Now, in the interest of time, we will want to formally start the program by all of us standing up as we listen to the national anthem. Thank you very much. May you be seated, please. Before I call on our registrar and CEO of the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators, Ixan, Mrs. Taiwo Ganiat Olushesi, FCIS, to give us her welcome address, I want to recognize the presence of the DG of NILDS, Professor Suleiman Abubakar. He'll be joining us. Uh, permit me to recognize the presence of Mrs. Vicky Irabo, ACIS, the President, Defense and Police Officers Wife Association. Madam, you are welcome. Thank you very much. And then I'd like to recognize the presence of the Association of Professional Bodies of Nigeria. Uh, the President is represented by the first Deputy President. Is he here? Thank you very much, sir. You are welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, we will be introducing others as they come. I will also like at this point to recognize the chairman of Iksan Abuja chapter, Mr. Adedeji Adebi, ACIS. Thank you very much. And then the chairman of Iksan Lagos State chapter, Mr. Olufe Mishoko, FCIS. You are welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Um, also, we have here present uh, some of our council uh, members, and I would like to recognize them. A number of them are online. Um, I want to recognize Mr. Francis Olawale, FCIS, our honorary treasurer. You are welcome, sir. And then I want to welcome our immediate past president, Mr. Bode Ayeku, FCIS, is with us online. Permit me to welcome Mrs. Linda Onefeli, FCIS, who is also involved in this uh, event, in organizing this event. And then Mr. Yomi Adebanjo, FCIS. You are welcome, sir. My elder, you are welcome. I would like to recognize the presence of Dr. Adeyinka Hassan, FCIS. These are members of council. You are welcome, sir. And then Mrs. Uto Akpana, FCIS. Oh, my apologies. Opana, oh, you are welcome. Man. <laughs> my apologies. Thank you very much. Um, can I recognize the presence of Mrs. Abiola Olashein, the FCIS? You are welcome. Thank you very much, ma'am. As well as the presence of Mr. Tony Okuma, FCIS. You are welcome, sir. May I recognize the presence of Mr. Babatunde Peluora, FCIS. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. And then, uh, finally, but not the least, uh, I want to, of course, the registrar will call her up. Ladies and gentlemen, at uh, this... Thank you. Hmm. I almost committed uh, an offense of omission for which I hope I will be forgiven. 
ladies and gentlemen, I want to recognize the presence of Mrs. Benedicta Shadare, FCIS. You're welcome, ma. Thank you very much. We will recognize others as the program goes on, but in the interest of time, ladies and gentlemen, I want to call upon our registrar CEO to come forward to give her welcome address. Thank you very much, MC, Mr. President and Chairman of Council, distinguished guests on the I table, our Chairman, our keynote speaker, our esteemed Council members. The MC tried to establish a protocol, but um, it is my duty to establish it properly. So I recognize our Vice President, Mrs. Fumi Ekundayo, FCIS, our Honorary Treasurer, Mr. Francis Olawali, FCIS. You're welcome, sir. Dr. Adeyinka Azan, FCIS. Mr. Ayomi Adebanjo, FCIS. Mrs. Biolala Sengde, FCIS. Mrs. Benedicta Shadari, FCIS. Alaji Abibu Tijani, FCIS. Mr. Babatunde Peleura, FCIS. And Mrs. Linda Onefeli, FCIS, Chairman, Publicity and Advocacy Committee. I also recognize Dr. Mohamed Wakil Owen, FCIS, Mrs. Jacqueline Odiadi, FCIS, you're all welcome. It's going to be a short welcome speech. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you to the 2022 annual public lecture of our institute, the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria. The public lecture is an important event in the institute's calendar, and it has become an established platform through which the Institute contributes to national discourse on trending issues of national or global significance. Through this platform, the Institute has over the years contributed positively to the policy direction of this country by availing the authorities of the much needed policy guidance and recommendations. The private sector has also benefited from useful ideas and recommendations we have been offering through our annual public lecture. Outside, there is a stand, there is a book stand, all our communiques which have been published are there for us to buy. At the end of this program, there's going to be a communique which will be circulated to everybody here present, those joining us virtually and all relevant stakeholders. As it's our practice every year, we have chosen a very apt, trendy and engaging theme for the public lecture. The idea is to bring all issues relating to the theme to front burner of intellectual, discourse with a view to produce very enriching perspectives from which useful recommendations can be made. And in compliance with this tradition, we have also chosen our 2022 annual public lecture to um, the theme, external reserve dynamics and governance challenges. I believe this affects everybody in this country. As we are uh, aware, of the plethora of governance challenges rocking our nation, these challenges have unfortunately been detrimental to the growth of our country, and as such, today's theme is very important, and I urge us to participate actively. We are also going to be launching a stamp and seal in Abuja today. It is for our practitioners um, to affix on documents emanating from them on compliance, regulation, and all others. That is going to be part of activities for today. We're also going to be launching the fourth volume of our Journal of Corporate Governance. I also urge us to participate in this launching and also make purchases afterwards. On this note, I welcome you to the 2022 Annual Public Lecture of Ixan. Thank you. Thank you very much, our registrar and CEO, for that sharp and uh, crips in welcome comment. Um, 
I would like at this point to call upon, in line with our program, our president, Institute of Charter Secretaries and Administrators, Mr. Taiwo Wenga or Wokolade, FCIS, to give us his opening address. President, sir. Good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome each and every one of us to this program. And I'm so excited that we're here today because to us as an institute, this is actually a day of history. And we're happy to be here to bring our foremost CSR program to Abuja. And I'm excited that this is happening. And I'm also happy to see all of my council members in the house. So on that note, I want to appreciate my CEO for speaking about why we are here and the, and the, and the institute. But for, first and foremost, let me go ahead and um, appreciate the chairman of today's program, our own dear Honorable Minister, Festus Kayamo, SAN, who has also found it not only worthy to say that he will join us online, but to also send someone that will come and stand in his, to come and sit on his seat and be able to represent him. And there are special advisor to the, to the minister, I want to thank you. I want, by deciding to join online, he doesn't need to send someone here, but he committed himself to coming. When he couldn't make it, he assured us that he would send somebody to come and sit in for him, and he will still join online to make his presentation. Extend our good Warmest greetings to him. We sincerely appreciate that guest. I also have very great distinguished ones that are in the house to support this initiative. When they kept working in, you wouldn't know how much of the day that they are made for us. Some are on their way, they sent SMS that will be here. They are looking forward to their coming. They are seeing their forebearers that have come. For those who are already seated in the house, we sincerely want to thank you. And on that note, I want to appreciate Mrs. Vicky Mirabo, a member and also the president of Defense and, and Police Officers Welfare Association. She gave us the assurance. As early as 9 a.m., we have seen the, the protocols that have come on ground to give us an assurance that she'll be here. A few minutes to 11 o'clock, she won't be. I said, well, I wouldn't expect anything less than that. Not just that she's from the, the disciplined military environment, she's also of the very disciplined corporate governance institute. And that is a pleasure to be a part of us. Well. For the others that are not yet on seat, I would um, skip that aspect so that I don't overflow that. I know when they walk in. They will also be recognized. Yeah, where I was seated, I've, I've seen several of our SMSs um, um, saying that they're working about in the next five, ten minutes, you'll be seeing them. So when they come in, I think the MC and the protocol persons will also recognize that. For our keynote speaker, Professor Gongo Adi, I want to sincerely thank you all the way from Mother's Business School. You gave us that assurance, and then we are not also doing all right, but you assured us that we'll be here. In person, I want to thank you so much, my brother. We are excited that you have been able to meet this time. Also, I have in the house online, which is Tony Sonny. Um, she was so certain that she was going to be here, and then we all made all of those arrangements. There are times, you know, for a top, for a top person, when there are several things um, affecting your program, there's very little. That have been done. She was out of Nigeria for, for a while. She thought that her flight would be able to make it on yesterday for her to come to, to this program. It wasn't possible, so she told us she would be online and she's actually joined. I want to thank you so much. 
for my institute members as well as the council members. Okay, before that, let me also appreciate the APM, APBM president. We had an APBM board meeting yesterday. It was full of apologies that he will not be able to meet this, but he sent, he assured me that the first vice president will be here, and that is why we're already having in the house. Please extend our greetings to the APBM as well. We sincerely appreciate that. For my council members, we took a very tough decision about some of these issues. And seeing all of you in the house, looking radiant, looking sharp, looking good, I feel so happy that we're able to get this done. And on that note, I want to appreciate my VP for leading the other team to be here. And then, and then the treasurer is also seated beside, beside her. And other council members that have also, also been mentioned, I can see Biola last same day in the house. I can see um, Wakil, the Honorable Minister for, for, for Power in the house. He's also a council member. Thank you, my brother. I can see Mr. Kwele Wura, not only a council member, the chairman of this committee, and the chairman of the local organizing committee based in Abuja, that worked tirelessly towards ensuring that they deliver this. We are happy for you, my brother. Um, I can also see in the house Mr. Yomi Adibanjo, that is the chairman of the membership committee. My brother, thank you for being available. Dr. Azan, it's a great one. Um, later when we get to council, we'll talk about how you turn yourself to carrying all of this here to make this program to be wonderful. We really, really need my team place today. Thank you, my brother, for being in the house. Tony, um, Mr. Tony Okoma, it's, it's a great thing to see in the house. That is the chairman of the, uh, the chairman of the uh, implementation and monitoring committee. He's the policeman council. I also have in the house Mr. Tigani Mwane. I like Tigani Mwane. Based in Kaduna. Another wonderful member of the council. Then we have our great Yelu Yelu. Tony, uh, uh, Mrs. Uto Pana. She's, she's the chairperson of the building committee. We are working on the new building for the institute. She's the one that is starting with it. She wants to do it. God will sustain the work to do it. I also have in the house in the the chairman of the Law Reform Committee. We are a governance institute, but we don't take lightly the issue of the issue of law. So we have someone that is seated permanently on that committee, driving that initiative. And that is ODIG um, um, Jacqueline Yemi. It's, it's a pleasure to have you here. Another wonderful member, very shadow. It's, it's a great thing to have all of you in the house. And I won't actually forget the chairman of Abuja. Chapter. The guys have actually been the point in mobilizing the scene towards the shrine that we deliver. So, for all of this, when it comes to appreciating that committee, I'm sure we are going to get to that. But sincerely speaking, for what we are seeing today, um, besides the council taking this very beautiful decision, we also need to appreciate those who are on the ground showing that this initiative is delivered. Um, the chairman of the Commission of the Committee, I want to thank and thank your team for making this to be very possible. And um, also our council members who are, that are online, including past presidents that have also joined us online. I want to welcome and appreciate each and every one of you. For all participants that are in-house, most importantly, and those that are also online. As at the time I, I, I started by my speech, we have gotten close to about 300 people that have, that have been online. And for all that is huge, I want to sincerely thank them for staying online. For our media partners, we can't just thank you enough. We had a media, we had a media party on Monday, and by Tuesday, the entire newspaper and all of those areas have been, have been taken care of. So I want to thank, I've already seen some of them in the house. So I want to sincerely thank you for the wonderful support that you have given us. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to this very important occasion. For us as an institute, um, this is an annual program. Um, but last year and the year before, we just, because of COVID and this challenge, we couldn't really, we really have the physical function. We had it virtual. But this year, the world is opening up. We just told ourselves this is the right time to come out again. And for a long while, we have done this program in Lagos. But coming out of COVID, they are looking at the entire system and our, and our institute. 
to say, let's come to our vision. Most importantly, because the topic that we are looking at, the topic we are looking at is much more important to those of us, although important to not only Nigerians, but all over the world, but most importantly, the key stakeholders who play a major role in the issue of our personal, personal resource management and all of those things. We are based, they, are, they are seated in Cuba. And that is why when we started this initiative, we went from door to door of those key stakeholders, and that is why we had a lot of them in the house. We are happy that we invited you, and virtually all of you are here. We also gave you an we have also give you an assurance that at the end of the day, the community will be properly circulated to all of the key stakeholders. So that it's not just about talking about it, but also getting the materials to you and working with you towards ensuring that this program achieves the purpose of which has been set up. And we're also able to see the, 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 the positive narratives going forward. And I won't want to delve into that into that topic, but that's why we have brought topic experts to speak about it and then also be able to like, give us things for discussion and other all of us that are here to, to also be able to raise questions for further comments. Uh, this is an issue that is at the heart of governance that affects you and I. And we need to be bold enough to be able to address it here. So for us as an institution, it's not a matter of the municipal leadership community, it's a matter of providing the platform for resource persons to come, look at this issue, talk about it from different perspectives. Because the issue that you are talking about is not peculiar. Nigeria, even though we are talking about the implications on the Nigerian the economy and the citizens, but it's, it's something that is affecting the entire world. Every economy talks about it. The so, how well did they manage their own? What are the challenges that we are facing? Right now? Will there be other ways of managing our own salaries? So, what's ensuring that we need to be able to do this for you and I? In the last few months, we have engaged into a lot of advocacy. And we also have several operational members who work in several other organizations. And we feel what they feel. So there's no point pretending that this issue does not concern us. The best way is to bring it to the table and allow each and every one of us to speak about it and then be able to like come out together and make a meaning out of this. So I will not want to take much of our time. I'll give the floor to, to the people that we have brought to come and speak about this. But on the last note, on behalf of the Institute, I want to welcome each and every, I want to welcome all of us to this function, both those that are here in the hall and those that are online. I welcome you to this, to this function and I look forward and also look forward to having a very wonderful session. At the end of the day, I'm believing that this is going to be the beginning of a wonderful relationship between all of you that are here and also the Institute. For those of us who have been invited that we have just come and you are not a member of the Institute, this is an opportunity to look again at this Institute. This is the foremost governance institute that is there to serve as a convergence for all of the other professional bodies. And together, we are here to move the nation forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, dear president. Can we give him another round of applause, please? Uh, thank you. Before we proceed uh, to the business of the day, I would like to use the opportunity to recognize other dignitaries that are here present. If you remember at the very beginning, I recognized the presence of the DG of the Nigerian Institute of Legislative and Democratic Studies at the National Assembly, uh, the Prof. Um, I want to say that the DG is ably represented here by the Director of Administration and Human Resources in the person of Dr. Kabri Ahmed. You are welcome, sir. Thank you very much. I also like to use this opportunity to recognize the presence of Mr. Idowu Bello, the Group Managing Director of Dumbbell Investments Group. Mr. Bello, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Permit me, ladies and gentlemen, to recognize the presence of Dr. King's Jack, 
who is the regional manager, North Central Region of Bank of Industry. Dr. Jack, are you here? You're welcome. Thank you. Um, at this point, I want to welcome members of my own constituency, the legal profession. I want to recognize Mr. Monde Aje, who is the chairman, NBA Buari branch. He's here with his executive. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. We are very grateful. Now, we also have a special guest here that will put your mind at rest, that what we're doing will not land you into any serious trouble because we have the pleasure of having in our midst the secretary to the Economic and Financial Crime Commission, Dr. George Ekungu. Doctor, you are welcome. Thank you very much. You must have been listening to the present, president's speech. Notice that he has also recognized other members of the Ixon Council. Um, they, I want to formally recognize my own chairperson, the chairman of the Law Reform Commission, Mrs. Jacqueline Oodia, the FCIS. You are welcome, ma'am. Thank you very much. May I also welcome the presence of Ms. Victoria Okajobi, FCIS. You are welcome. Permit me also to welcome uh, the presence of Alaji Habibu Tijani, FCIS. is a member of council, as well as our own honorable Dr. Mohammed Wakil, OON, ACIS. You are welcome, sir. Thank you very much. I know you are anxious for us to get to the meat of our conversation today. And uh, you are not alone because as the president has rightly pointed out, this is an issue of utmost national importance. Okay, thank you very much. I want to recognize members of the Corporate Affairs Commission here present, who are also members of Ixan. You are welcome, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you. As we look at the state of our external reserve as a nation, you will almost agree with me and with Charles Deakin that it, will be, it was the best of times and the worst of times. It is the age of wisdom. It was also the age of foolishness. While the purpose of today's public lecture is not to turn us overnight into developmental economists, an enlightened citizenry is essential to nation building. And in this very critical aspect of our national economic landscape, I want to paraphrase the words of Charles Oputa otherwise known as Charlie Boy, that our Mumu don't do. Welcome to the Ixan 2022 Annual Public Lecture with the team, External Reserve Dynamics and Governance Challenges. To do justice to this topic, the Ixan faculty has cast its nets far and wide to find an authentic voice that can speak with truth and justice to the issue. It's very clear with the volatility we have experienced in our foreign exchange, which is also linked to the foreign reserves, and the fact that all of us here have seen the effect on our national and personal lives. It's therefore my great pleasure to introduce to us our keynote speaker today. May I ask Professor Bongo Adi to stand on his feet as we read out a summary of a summarized version of his intimidating profile. <laughs> you know, when I started to investigate the man, I was like, wow. And we are privileged that in our country, we have men and women who through application of their intellectual industry can speak 
without any doubt to these issues and profound solution. And I want us to be very clear that this gathering is not a gathering of critics. Rather, it's a gathering of men and women who are looking for solutions to the problem of our country or the challenges. Professor Bongo Adi is professor of economics and data analytics in the economics, data analytics, and strategic business intelligence department of Lagos Business School, Pan-Atlantic University, Nigeria. Ladies and gentlemen, he is a development economist, a macroeconomist, a corporate strategist, a data scientist, a PPP and project finance expert with over two decades of experience in development economics research, consulting, and strategy policy advisory, capital raising, business development, and data analytics. Dr. Adi holds a PhD in regional science and development economics and an MSc in economics development and policy management under the joint Japan World Bank Graduate Scholarship of the University of Tsukubo, Japan. He did a postdoctoral training in data mining at the National Agricultural Research Center, Japan. He is also equally a recipient of several awards, including the United Nations University Fellowship in 2000, the World Bank Scholarship in 2000, as well as the Japanese Scholarship for International Students 2004 to 2006. His research has been presented in numerous international conferences, workshops, and have been published in top-ranking international journals. He's equally a regular economist and business analyst on Channels TV, CNBC Africa, TVC, Arise TV, Silverbird, and AIT. He's the chairman of the board of Prime Media Limited and sits on the board of several other blue chip companies and foundations. Is equally served as a member of the editorial board of National Economy, Prime News, and Daily Independent newspapers. Professor Bongadi is a celebrated policy economics activist who uses the media to keep the managers of the economy on their feet. He is Nigeria's leading policy economist with international media footprint. Ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome Professor Bongadi. To the podium as he makes his presentation. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, the anchor. I hope I live up to the bidding. That's over hyping. You know, in Nigeria, we like to hype too much. Um, dear President, the Chairman of the Council, distinguished dignitaries and members of Ixan. I stand on the existing protocol. It's my pleasure and honor to be with you this afternoon. Uh, this is my first interaction with uh, Ixan. Um, I'm a member of uh, ICANN's um, um, continuing education program and I facilitate several of their of their public sector engagement as well. I've also been a guest speaker to the Nigerian Institute of Manage Management um, corporate uh, programs, as well as moderating some of their uh, sessions. Uh, Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry as well. I've al always interacted with them. Yeah, I'm also a member of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group. I uh, belong to several committees there. But this is the first time I've come to Ixan. And yeah, the, the topic is very interesting. Well, I think we are living in very, I said at the beginning of this year that I will not say anything negative about the economy. So because of that, I've stopped uh, making media appearances. Uh, they keep you know, pestering me on a daily basis, the newspapers, um, the TVs. But I said I will not show up, so that I will not say anything negative because I believe there is power in words. I think it's about time we begin to project more positive um, you know, thoughts and thinking about the Nigerian economy because 
there is power in positivity. It has its own power, you know, to make things um, turn around. Uh, we are at that point where things must turn around. Otherwise, I really do not know what we can hope for. Today's topic is very interesting, like I said, external reserve dynamics and the challenges of governance. Um, from the way the president, you know, pitched it or framed it, it will appear like, uh, you know, we're going to critique the government, the way they're managing the external reserve. But for me, I, I would say that, you know, better management will actually be to grow that reserve. It's not about managing it. We don't have anything. That's the truth. Um, I, I wouldn't go to explain. Uh, let me start from, from the last, actually. Yeah, I, I will go in reverse order. Let me share with you some pictures, you know, some charts. You know, economics, I'm a data person, so we can never do without graphs and charts and all of that. So I, I, I hope that you can, you know, you follow me. Okay, so I, I want to start with the last pages. Okay, l let, me, let me start from this one. Yeah, so if you look at that, you will see the key drivers of the Nigerian economy. I don't know if you can see that graph uh, clearly. So you will begin to observe the economic transmission path. What you recognize there is that there are four major drivers, the key drivers of our economy. The first one is the capital flow. So what do we mean by capital flow? You know, the monies, the funds. Capital, um, economists will refer to it as capital importation. And then when you talk of capital importation, you will be speaking to foreign direct investment and foreign portfolio investment. The direct investment is the businesses, uh, the firms that foreigners come to establish in our country, operate them, which create jobs, you know, reduce unemployment, and of course, enhance productivity and competitiveness. Portfolio investment is just for treasure hunters, those bargain hunters who are only interested in the benefits that will come from equities capital markets. So they put their money in the capital market. Once there is any perception of risk, they are very fast to withdraw and run away. That is very volatile and causes a whole lot of problems for any economy. But we have had a lot of that. Foreign direct investment has dwindled significantly. I mean, some states have not managed to attract any single investment in the past two years in Nigeria. And as a country, our we used to be the prime destination for foreign direct investment some years back, but that's no longer the case. You don't blame investors and you don't blame capital. We, capital, as we say, is a coward. Um, the level of insecurity in Nigeria cannot incentivize any investor to come in here. So what we have is the investment of the portfolio type, which is very volatile. It's not something you can bank on. Then the other one is, of course, trade. So I'm trying to build up, you know, what we mean by external reserve, okay? Inflows, capital inflow into your economy. It can come from um, our exports, okay, trade. When we trade, we're an open economy. We trade with the rest of the world. So when we sell our, well, the only thing we sell these days is oil. So when we sell, market our oil to the, to the rest of the world, the proceeds come in, that is the, you know, uh, what determines our trade. Uh, balance, or what you call the current account, or primary income balance, as economists will regard it. The primary income balance, which is just the difference between the export and the import. Okay? In, in, for some years now, we've also have deficit, current account deficit, meaning that import is more than export. That is a huge burden on the standard result. So, um, you know, you may say those guys at CBN, they're not managing it well. But then remember that <laughs> everything we are wearing, most of them are not made in Nigeria right now. So that is a drain 
it, that put pressure on that external reserve. Because if we are not able to export enough goods or services, you know, to compensate for what we have paid at, that means we are in deficit, right? There will be a drawdown on our external reserve. I hope you're understanding that. So it is not just about government. It's actually about, about us, about the private firms in the system, the competitiveness of the economy. The challenge we have today is the challenge of, you know, competitiveness has zeroed out. That is a fact. Like I said, nothing negative. I just want to, be, to give um, uh, more like um, a descriptive analysis. So let me describe the situation without passing any judgment. So I'm not about you know, making any normative statement or how it should be. So let's describe the situation the way it is. So we've got this problem that we lack competitiveness. To betray that point, a country such as Niger and Chad have become more export competitive than us. That is a cause to worry. Okay, what do I mean by competitiveness? What are we selling to the rest of the world? Um, in economics, so we've seen that trade is a big issue. Um, in the past, say in 2007, 07, when the rest of the world were in financial crisis, we are completely insulated. Part of the reason was that our capital market, our financial system, um, wasn't really fully integrated into the global financial architecture. Then, remember, that was the early days of um, bank uh, capitalization. But after that capitalization and all the reforms, financial reforms, so we now put ourselves into the global financial system. So we become susceptible to contagion effect, meaning that whatever happened in the US will affect us. Whatever happened in Ukraine, Russia is affecting us. The United States has raised rates to 75% basis points. That is, you know, um, yeah, 75% basis point would be like 0.75 of a percentage point. So, it's small, but it's big. The impact on us is going to be massive. The reason is because of that thing you see in there. Okay? The, all the key drivers are external. So the importance of external reserve, again, the essence of this lecture, why I think the lecture was very well chosen, the topic. Because I've always been talking about this in my classes, in my interactions, in my engagement, about the importance of the external sector. The foreign sector is the most critical in any, any economy. And no economy has developed using its bootstrapping its own resources. No. What do you have? We don't have technology. We don't have human resources. I was in a program to, uh, the other day, GNAM, Global Network of uh, ACSB accredited uh, MBA uh, schools, uh, students from Harvard, from all the top business schools on that program. And there is this Chinese, he's, he's my student, he's an MBA student at LBS, and he runs a business in Nigeria. What was he complaining about? Lack of competent human resources. I don't know if you have observing that also in your own firms. Finding competent people is becoming extremely difficult. Sometimes, some skills cannot be found any longer. The little we have, the next they are all running to Canada. InterSwitch is a unicorn. Unicorn is a company, FinTech, that has that has managed to you know, raise a billion dollars. InterSwitch has got to about $3 billion right now. 
So they're doing great. But they are suffering massively because when they recruit people and train them, before you count two, they are in Canada. All the consulting firms are facing that. And I'm sure that most of us here also, your kids are not here. They are not planning to come back. That's the reality. So when you have this sort of brain drain, then where are you going to get that competitiveness that we are talking about? Because the standard reserve is nothing. It is uh, it's just like you, you haven't worked. You haven't saved money. So do you have, what do you have in your bank account? So your bank account is proportional, right, to your efforts, your work, what you do, the efforts that you make. You know, some people work harder than others. So if you work very hard, you earn a lot of money, then you can save it. You save after you've uh, spent, you know, uh, done your disposable income, then you have savings. So saving is proportional to our, our work effort. And, and that's, that's the reality. So that's the standard reserve. The standard reserve is like our savings. In 2006 to 2007, 2008, that time, by the time Yaradua came to uh, power in 2007, right, our external reserve hit about $69 billion. That actually signaled to the rest of the world that Nigeria has arrived. Remember BRINK, that acronym, BRINK, Mint, Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, Nigeria, China. Now, Nigeria is out, so it's back to brick. So they formulated, cash that acronym to reflect the resurgence, you know, of Nigeria. You know, if you recall, most of the themes, conferences, you know, workshops then were all about Africa rising. Which Africa was rising? It was Nigeria rising. I know so many friends who had to pack up abroad and return to Nigeria. You know, they were attracted by opportunities that were emerging in the country. I'm talking about a decade ago or a little more. Okay, so Nigeria was on a sure-footed path to sustainable long-term growth in a firm trajectory. Now, you will ask me then what happened. Jonathan happened. Okay, so, but how was that external reserve that, you know, so, so the external reserve was built from prudential macroeconomic management. Okay, we had fiscal buffers, and then we had the budget benchmark oil price. That's when it started. So anything, if oil price went above the stipulated budget benchmark, you know, it was sterilized, kind of saved. So that's what really led to that creation in the external uh, balance. Now, that firmed up the currency, and it wasn't, sim it wasn't because of anything any central bank governor did. Simply because we had huge, you know, growing external balance. Our currency became stable. And we had a stable currency for a relatively, almost a decade, right? Simply on the back, riding on the back of that strong external balance, $69 billion. Mary Lynch, Goldman Sachs, Standard & Poor, all those rating agencies took interest in Nigeria. And then they elevated us from junk status we were rated BB plus, BB positive. You know what that implied? It means that we had very strong, you know this, some, some people know this better than I do. We had very strong um, credit worthiness. So we could borrow. And don't forget, that was the time we, renegotiated, we renegotiated all our debts. We became almost, I mean, debt free. Nigeria was 
almost coasting home. Nearly, nearly, nearly. You know, the thing I, I keep t- saying is that why do we have this incredible capacity to, to grab defeat from the jaws of victory? You know, we say that somebody will grab victory from the jaws of defeat. Our own is the reverse. We were always working very hard to, to you know, get defeat out of victory. That's the story of 2009 to 2014. Our economy was on a sustainable um, long-term growth. Competing with the likes of China, we are better off than Indonesia. Ten years ago, just ten years ago, Indonesia didn't have our statistics. Today, the capita income in Indonesia has risen to about $20,000. The capita income in Nigeria is less than a thousand dollars. Okay, so I'm not here to blame the management of the Senate Reserve. You don't have much. So look at the determinants of our economy. We're an externally driven economy. We keep saying that we are import dependent economy. I don't like what, that word. Don't use it. We are externally driven economy. There is no economy in the world that is not import dependent, by the way. So let me clear that. Some economies are even, in fact, if we were highly productive, okay, the bulk, the proportion of import, contribution of import to our GDP will be higher. Right now, in the whole of Africa, um, imports as a percentage of GDP in Nigeria is one of the lowest. I'm not saying that we should go and import everything. If we are highly productive and export oriented, okay, we will become like um, you know, a hub, a hub, a production hub, manufacturing everything for the rest of the world. So, and if we are, if we are connected to the global value chain, so it simply means that we will have some value retention as value you know, passes through um, our, our, our system to other countries, as I will demonstrate also with another um, chart that you will see. So another driver of, of our economy is diaspora remittances. Diaspora remittances is huge. We've seen effort by the central bank, you know, to incentivize uh, diaspora remittances. You know, this uh, is that five naira for any dollar that people bring, that incentive. So they've been trying to grow that. Countries have used that massively. China and India leverage mainly their diaspora population. This is something that it's just recently that we're beginning to be more strategic about it. And then the last one, in the, those four drivers, of economic uh, uh, dynamics in Nigeria. We've got trade, I've talked about um, capital flows, uh, um, diaspora remittances, and of course policies. Policies in the rest of the world. So when the United States increases rates, what happens to our capital market? Immediately begins to ble- bleed. Bargain hunters, we look for safe havens. The United States is offering better returns. They move away. We will be bleeding. So you have capital flight, massive capital flight. So given the scenario I've painted with those four drivers, what do you make of our economy? It is that we are very pro-cyclical. This is a pro-cyclical economy. When the international environment is good, we, we are happy. If it is not, we are sad. We do not have any domestic buffer. We do not have any domestic resilience. And that's a big, very big problem. Why don't we have domestic resilience? Because these are the things that drive the standard reserve. Domestic resilience, from my point of view, is the ability to compete with the rest of the world, the ability to gain some strategic trade advantage 
over our trading partners. As it is right now, we are simply dumping ground for all manner of stuff from every part of the world. Okay? So, what are we selling? What are we bringing to the market? Nothing. Except crude petroleum. The queues have returned. <laughs> Why? We do not have the capacity to process the petroleum, the crude oil that we uh, export. So, rather than us, you know, being in the money, as finance people will say, we are actually out of the money. When oil price is hitting $120 per barrel, we are crying. Rather than our external reserve growing, as in the past, with high oil prices, we have, you know, depletion of the external reserve. I don't want to talk about borrowing. I have no problem with borrowing. The problem I have is what you use the borrowed funds for. Okay? Again, um, I think that's something positive for Nigeria. I also have to say this, even though some people may see it as controversial. Yes, we will be serving the, I don't pity the next government, the, the one that will come next, whoever emerges as president. It's not going to have it rosy. Not at all. Because when you're already using almost 99% of your, of your independent revenue to service debt, what is left for you to provide any sort of service? Not much. Okay? So they have to be creative. And that is the creativity that I want to happen. I don't want to, you know, it's not about, I don't want to cause the darkness. Let us light a candle. Okay? Let not, let's stop causing the darkness. Let's find a way to light a candle. So how do we like it, light a candle? Um, borrowing is not bad. If anybody think about it, if you go to your friends and they lend you money, and you go again, they give you money. You go again, they give you money. Would you go again? You will. It's rational. It means that they find you credit worthy. Because would you lend, lend money to someone you know that will never pay? There is no, I, I'm not sure anybody is happy lending money, even to your friend. Me, I, as an economist, I won't lend you money that I know that I will not get. So I will only give you what I know that I can do, do without. Okay? That's rationality. That's, I'm being rational. And I think all of us are rational. So think of, of, of that, you know, in relation to countries. So if a country is able to raise money any time it goes, for instance, we issue euro bond and it's oversubscribed. Each time we issue, it's oversubscribed. That means they find us uh, credible enough. If they find us credible enough, if you're in government, you will borrow. So let us not uh, sit at home and condemn government for high borrowing because it's the easiest form of capital. It's credit. It's capital. The challenge is what are they doing with it? Okay? Are we using it to create the necessary required liquidity in the system? Because that's what this is all about. Because when you have, if the economy is liquid, things can move. Things can move. Okay? Jobs will come. Unemployment will reduce. So it's about the external war, the external sector. That is the key thing. So, um, I, yeah, I have that, the structural defects. In the, when we talk about the output production, the total things that have Nigeria, Nigeria has as a country, okay, our GDP, our GDP is made up of uh, the first one is consumption. Output is consumption, investment, consumption plus investment plus what government spends plus the difference between export and import, which we call net export. Now, you can break that down also into economic structures. Okay? Into economic structures. The first one, C, consumption, is household, you and I. That is a, a, a structure or a sector of the economy. Then I is investment. Investment is for firms. 
firms, companies. Okay? So they are the ones that if you, if you are an SME, you, you are an investment. You are an inv investor. That's an investment in the economy. So that's a, a sector. Then you have the government sector or the public sector. Consumption, investment, government, and then the last one, the fourth one, is the difference between export and the import, which is the outward looking one. That we call it the external sector or the foreign sector. The foreign sector. If you look at the first chart, the, that first graph where we showed the, the four drivers of the economic dynamics, capital flow, trade, diaspora remittances, policies. Okay, if you relate it to that, what we see is that the external sector is the most important, is the most important um, sector in every economy, not just Nigerian economy. The external sector. Because that is where, when you talk about foreign exchange, that's where it comes from. When you talk about external reserve, that is where it comes from. Now, how do we build that external reserve? That's a challenge. We do not grow an economy based on consumption. No. Your consumption, if you look at the growth in our GDP, both, most of it is actually consumption driven, which means it is a nominal thing. It is not adding much value. Either that or government. Yeah, no problem with government. Government can invest in infrastructure and public uh, goods and services. That's fine. But the key things that will create sustainable long-term, sustainable, that is long-term growth, is what? Investment and the external sector. Investment and the external sector. That is firms that are able to produce goods and services they can export. Goods and services that are exportable, export orientation. If we do not create an export oriented economy, we are in big trouble. We are in big trouble. Gone are the days of import substitution. The only reason why we had $69 billion external reserve in 2007, 2008, is because oil price went up. Our production was also good enough. So we were, you know, shipping all the time. And then we had prudential management system installed with those financial system reforms. So that accretion happened which consolidated the exchange rates, which kind of gave investors confidence regarding our economy and started attracting interest, simply because we grew the external balance, the external reserve. But ever since we have not managed to do that, it's a big problem. Investors have disappeared. Um, all those companies, those rating agencies I mentioned, they've delisted Nigeria one after the other. I don't know if you follow that. You know, imagine, imagine, uh, imagine market, uh, Goldman Sachs, imagine market bond, we've been delisted a long time ago. Some of those international bank, HSBK and all of them, that were here, they've left. Okay. We, don't, we haven't come here to blame anybody. It's not about government. They are doing the best they can. Let's keep it there. But it's the responsibility of each and every one of us. What is it that you're doing? Because we, kind of, we, we, we are in this sort of narcissism. Narcissism. We are locked into ourselves. We don't even care what is going on in the rest of the world. Okay? Politics, sorry, I have to go there, has to be entrepreneurial. Has to be entrepreneurial. What do I mean by entrepreneurial politics? The kind that the guy in Rwanda is doing. 
what does he do? He goes to lobby top firms to set up production bases in his com um, country, giving them all the necessary conditions, I mean, um, protections and incentives. They create jobs. He collects taxes. He builds, because the exports, his external reserve builds up. Why is China? China's external reserve, I don't want to know, I don't, you don't want to hear what it is. It's in trillions of dollars. So they can do whatever they like with their currency. And they can stand up to America. When you don't have that buffer, there is nothing you can do. You know, we, we, we are like without hedge, no protection. The wind, everything, the little rumble of the sea. You know, we become float some and loop some in the, this whole wide ocean. That's why we are buffeted left, right, and center. Our exchange rate is like comic, has become comical. Simply because of that external reserve, nothing more. If external reserve increases, the exchange rate immediately will, will behave. Simple. Uh, maybe you would want me to talk about um, liberalizing, deregulating the exchange rate market and allowing the market determine rate. So this is the normal like, microeconomic deba debate between the monetarist and the structuralist. But I'm not going to go there. Government should have a responsibility in every government. Because I, I've, I, luckily, I lived in Japan, so I understand the East Asian economies very well. They don't leave much to the market. Okay? Yeah, a lot of people, the Chicago people, they pre preach to us about the Washington consensus and why we must liberalize everything. We should let the market work. But then, we need to realize that this is a developing economic contest. We have so many uh, market failures, so many issues that the market cannot resolve, requiring the government direct intervention. I can give you the example, side example. I like to use this example of Japan, when they call, what they call the Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration, if you can Google that, you will understand. It was a CBN, the, the central bank of, the governor of the central bank of, of Japan that actually initiated the Meiji Restoration. What did he do? Similar to what the CBN do, is doing, but this one is more transparent, transparent and accountable and evaluated and monitored progress. And then wherever they didn't get the result they, 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 they wanted, they anticipated, they rejected it. So that governor then, this is in the 18th century, intervened in the key sectors of the economy. Even in education, Japanese education was low quality. Their universities could not compete with that of Europe. What did that governor do? He went all over the Japanese universities, those old universities, selected very brilliant young men and women, and sent them to the top schools all over the world, in Germany, in Netherlands, in the United States, and in the UK. The same thing China does. Okay? When you talk about spending on education, on scholarship, China is number one. They send all their brilliant chaps. If you are in any department, if you study anywhere in the world and you don't have a Chinese classmate, then you know that this, the university you have gone to is not a good one. <laughs> Sorry. No, but that's a fact. Any school you go to in Europe, you will have, if you studied abroad, you will definitely have a Chinese classmate. Right? Do they pay school fees? Have you ever wondered? Even here, you can't compete with the Chinese here. Can you? You cannot. Why? The government gives them zero interest loan for everything. So, even in the co that commodity in your village, the Chinese will price it higher than you. Because he's getting the money free. Same thing with their scholarship. They have... The, so this is about strategy. Okay? So, but again, there is that national consciousness, that sense of patriotism. When these guys finish, they come back. 
And those they were the people that engineered what you know today as the Japanese miracle, okay, which has filtered into the other Asian tigers, Malaysia, Singapore, South Korea, even China. They all learning from Japan. If you check their currencies, you see that if you bring up Japanese yen and bring up the North Co uh, South Korean won or the renminbi, it's the same. Almost the same. Like they are copying everything Japanese t the Japanese did. So what am I saying? It's about strategic human capital development. How do we get integrated into the global value chain? Uh, I have a lot of stuff there, but don't have time to... Uh, I don't want to bog you with all those. I will write these things clearly, you know, produce a kind of um, um, a paper that you can share, you know, in your, uh, what do you call it? There is this thing, uh, I would like to close with it. This is Nigeria's, um, look at our product space. This is what we are exporting. See how black it is. Everything is crude oil, crude oil, crude oil, crude oil. Don't forget that this is the industry of the second industrial revolution. Which industrial revolution are we now? Fourth. Four IR. We are not even, we haven't even mastered this. Because when I'm talking about the challenge that's going to face the incoming administration, it's enormous. Okay? Um, our competition is not tribal. Our competition is international. But we are not looking at that. This is a very undiversified product space. This is what we export. Okay? The bo everything we export is just crude petroleum products. We do not add value. We can't, so when we are not adding value, there is no such thing as, as a foreign reserve, external reserve. It cannot grow. How will it grow? How can it grow? Because the only way it can grow is if we have surplus. That surplus is now pushed in there as buffer, you know, for the rainy day. That's exactly what it is. So if you notice that things, okay, there is a shortfall, deficit here and there, there's intervention in the foreign exchange market. But well, of course, they have bastardized it. And I think that's what the president was talking about the way it was being managed. Like I said, I'm not saying anything negative. I want to light a candle. Okay, so this is the thing that really interests me the most. The global value chain. This is called the smiley curve of global value chain. What a smiley? You know the smiley? The smiley, you know, that's um, the multiple. Right. So, this is for oil and gas. Again, this is traditional industry. Industry that is in, is, is, is in a, a, you know, very soon will, will disrupt, dis, disrupt, right? We are, we've been here for as long, I, I, I am 50 this year, by the way. So this is the only thing we've done all our life. Yet we are not anywhere on the global value chain of oil. When we talk about the value chain, we, are, we, are simply, we simply mean where the value is. So there are three. We can, we can disaggregate the production process or the value creation process into three. The first one is pre-production. In pre-production, what happens? That is the idea creation, research and development, innovation. Okay? It's huge value because once you have original idea, what do you do? You patent it, right? You've got trademark. You license it so that you could control the rights. You are lawyers, so patent. Then the next stage is production, manufacturing. You have pre-manufacturing. Then you have manufacturing. There is no value in manufacturing. It's the lowest value in the value chain. Do you now understand why when it comes to Apple computers, as you will see, see, the next one is Apple value chain. You see places where Apple manufacture all their products, where their processes take place, right? Um, the high value ones, where is it? In the US, okay? The low value one, like manufacturing, they take it to China, take it to Taiwan, take it to Vietnam, 
and Cambodia, we do we of course we cannot. We are not high value. We don't have that high tech. So we can't compete there. We are not there. In the low value, which is manufacturing, we are not there. Post manufacturing, which is another high value, we are not there. We are not integrated into any global value chain. How do we build a scenario? Because this is what is market. Like, you know, economy sometimes we confuse ourselves. We talk about the market as something that grows from the that come came down from the sky. No, no, no. Market is created. Okay? So I, I don't I don't describe the market in, 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 uh, in the aggregate form. I split it up. So I look at market for Apple. Apple market, right? Um, Samsung market. Or this uh, chair, chair market. Then you begin to understand it. Because there's no such thing as it. who owns the market. That's the question. Is it the, the, the demander or the producer? No. We are consumers. A consumer is not part of the market. You only there for the sake of the producer. The little that you're able to scrape up, scrape out from here and there, the producer will take it from you. What is the marginal cost of this computer? Marginal cost of producing this computer it may not be up to two dollars. How much do we buy it? A thousand dollars. And then we're smiling that we've got a good bargain. But we've lost $1,000 that we, you know, scrape off from here and there. The com countries that control this, HP, we don't, we, is there any Nigerian company here? No. We're talking about the 4IR. There is no single Nigerian company. The only place we are making some bit of wave is, this, is FinTech. Only. Only. So when you're talking about your uh, creation of your external reserve, that's FinTech that's contributing uh, and telecom. And then those telecoms, we don't own them. We used to boast that we have Davido, we have uh, Whiskey, we have the Bonaboy, that they are entertainment. None of those guys is Nigerian brand. And I doubt if any of them even carries Nigerian passports. The value, they are being marketed by global brands. There is no Nigerian involved in their marketing, I, I doubt it. So, what am I saying? How do we get into the global value chain? Product by product, item by item. That is what I mean by political entrepreneurship. You can, you just, Apple wouldn't just come and establish in Nigeria because they like Nigeria. Somebody needs to go talk to them, beg them, kneel before them, the CEO. What do you need? Please, my people are suffering. Come and help us. Exactly what the guy in Rwanda is doing. The same thing, this, this small country, Laos, Laos, Laos People's Republic. Right? Do you know this uh, Intel chip on your computer? The president went to the company, begged them, whatever you need. They came there and built, built a research and development plant. They employed about 5,000 Laos. How many people are in Laos? Eventually, Intel, that chip contributes 60% of their GDP. That is a standard result, sir. Thank you. I don't know whether our inability to give him a very resounding appreciation is because we are, let's appreciate the pro. Let's appreciate him. Let's appreciate him. Thank you. Thank you. You can see a man struggling to restrain himself. But I'm sure you took a lot of nuggets and we are grateful, Prof, for that promise you made to turn this into 
something we can read because your slides <laughs> they are very very <laughs> complex so that all of us we may not be experts like you but the earlier we begin to understand the fundamentals of what will help our country to leap forward and there are one or two things you said which strikes at something deep inside us. WhatsApp, I'm sure, must be thanking his stars for operating in Nigeria. Because that platform, like others, have become where we vent all our frustration against Nigeria, against the leadership, against everybody. But we are going away from here with your words. Don't cause the darkness. Light a candle. Ladies and gentlemen, we can light a candle. Every one of us. So that this country, we don't have any other like it. God's own country will reach to his very height. If you look at the words of Mandela, Nelson, the late Nelson Mandela. I said, the world will not respect Africa until Nigeria ends that respect. The black people of the world need Nigeria to be great as a source of pride and confidence. And you have shown us how we can achieve that. Thank you very much, Prof. We are very grateful. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we need to move forward in the interest of time. Please, can you confirm if the Honorable Minister of State have signed on now? Because she would like to speak to us for a few minutes online. Check. Can we check so that we can bring him on? Not yet, sir. Not yet. Thank you very much. Why he does that, we will go on to the next item in our agenda, which is to call in the discussants. Ladies and gentlemen, I had introduced this gentleman. I want to use the opportunity now because he's here present. Let me make it clear that he was here earlier now, but you know, NMPC is uh, very critical. So he got a very critical call. He stepped out, and I'm happy to say he has stepped back. Ladies and gentlemen, join me to welcome Mr. Rufai Khalid, ACIS, who is the GM litigation property and environmental law department of NMPC. You are welcome, sir. Please come on stage. Please, let's, let's encourage him. Ha, encourage him. We'll clap very well. This NMPC. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. You are welcome. I'll, uh, Tech, can you confirm I saw her online a few minutes ago. If Mrs. Toyin Sonny, FCIS is online. Yes, thank you very much, madam. Mrs. Toyin Sonny, FCIS, is the CEO, Emerging Africa Capital Group. I'm happy to say that this lady is one of Nigerians' brand. Because you just need to listen to her. You just need to hear her speak. She has fire in her bones. And I'm hoping that today, for the few minutes she has, she will speak to us. Mrs. Sonny, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. And I am trusting that I will live up to this billing. Um, I'd like to confirm that everybody can hear me well. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Please, I apologize for the lighting here. I've been moving around quite a bit. As has already been explained, I'm away to Kigali. I'm in Kigali, Rwanda. And it was interesting hearing the prof speak about Rwanda. But let me start by acknowledging and congratulating the president of, um, of our dear Ixan and um, the council members of Ixan for this great occasion, for this wonderful way of giving back to society by developing the body of public knowledge and awareness on such an important topic as our external reserve dynamics and governance challenges. I also want to um, 
honor the presence of the Honorable Minister Ibley represented and um, all um, dignitaries here and council members as well of uh, ITSAN. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be a discussant on this very important um, topic. And I'm going to start by really thanking and congratulating Professor Adi on such an enlightening presentation. Um, and may I also say a very passionate presentation about what Nigeria ought to do at a time like this. And I'm going to essentially follow um, in his steps by not even attempting to apportion blame, but just really share what I think we can do better. Um, let me start by saying that the clear explanation of the drivers of external reserves um, given to us by Prof are apt and very well received. So I commend you on talking about these clear drivers. These drivers include capital flows, trade, diaspora remittances, and the impact of policy. And may I say not just domestic policy, which is within our control, but policies of other um, governments, nationals, you know, other governments across the world that also have an impact. One of the policies, for example, international policies that affect capital flows is the recent decision, for example, by the United States government um, to into interest rates. Obviously, that makes um, investments in the U.S. more attractive to international investors and investments in emerging markets like ours automatically become less attractive. Remember that these are investments that are already classified as higher risk investments. I also um, totally align with the um, professor's emphasis on the need to focus on our ability to produce and export goods and services. And um, also on the very importance of the input of the factors of production, and such as qualified manpower, which unfortunately we are losing every day. Um, and all employers of labor in this room, I am sure, will attest to that. Because today, it is not just um, companies that are competing for personnel, it is countries that are competing, and economies that are competing for the best personnel across the world. Um, and um, mobility of personnel has become much easier than in the past. I also appreciate his emphasis on the need to focus on our ability to produce and export goods and services. And um, of course, on the importance of prudential economic management and fiscal buffers, which we have probably excelled better at in previous administrations, as he has also shared with us. Now, um, we cannot overemphasize the need to create an export-oriented economy. Um, and for me, I think this is time to look well beyond oil. Now, our speaker mentioned Rwanda. I'm presently in Rwanda. And clearly, one of the things that we realize is that the process of reactivating or regenerating or reviving an economy is not necessarily rocket science. It just takes determination, commitment, and indeed the combination of looking inwards and also looking outwards, some of which this government seems to be getting very correctly. Um, I think my only minor point of departure with Prof would be with his reference to um, foreign portfolio investments. And it's not really a point of departure. Maybe I would call it a point of um, maybe a little bit of elaboration. So I totally agree with the, the definitions of FDI and FPI and recognize that indeed foreign direct investment is the best for our economy because we're talking about attracting long-term, sticky, patient, and non-volatile flows of capital that um, come typically by way of um, Opening international country, uh, companies opening branches in Nigeria, equity investments in Nigerian startups, equity investments in um, Nigerian businesses, um, significant equity investments as opposed to portfolio investments. Um, so yes, this is desirable and this is great. But foreign, foreign portfolio investment is, of course, shorter-term investment in either equity or debt 
typically not necessarily substantial enough to gain control of those businesses, but as it says, a portfolio investment, and it also in- includes investments in both government securities and corporate securities. Now, I have personally, in my book, um, what I did in the a guide to investing in Nigeria, I likened um, foreign investments or foreign capital flows to blood in the body of a human being. And so I would say that FDI represents your ability to generate your own blood over time. But FDI represents infusion of blood, which you may get from time to time as required. Now, both are important, both are life-saving, both are life-giving. But obviously, if you are relying consistently on just injection of blood and you are not able to... um, as it were, build your own blood over time, then you will have a health crisis. So um, now I would like to go into my own um, comments and my own contributions specifically. Nations grow their foreign reserves, obviously, when their foreign exchange disbursements are kept poor than their foreign exchange receipts. The surplus gives rise to foreign reserves. Obviously, the reverse is also true. So when your disbursements and your, um, your foreign exchange disbursements are higher than your foreign exchange earnings, then you have what is called a deficit. And obviously, a sustained deficit will erode whatever reserves you have gained over time. So the sustained ability to achieve and maintain such surpluses is what leads to healthy and buoyant reserves, which is the desired state or state for any strong economy. Um, I have some statistics here which I can share, um, and they essentially show, and, and I will share, you know, after this, um, I'm not displaying the slides, but I will share this with the organizers after. It shows Nigeria's historical gross reserves over the past 12 years. So in 2010, our reserves stood at $32.35 billion, and um, within this period, peaked in 2012, at $44.18 billion, and um, as of 2021, was $40.52 billion, and then because of this year, of course, have dropped you know, significantly again since then. Now, if we were to compare these reserves with what obtains in other African countries, um, you will see that despite the fact that Nigeria is um, recognized as the largest economy in Africa, um, our foreign reserves at... Um, 38.54, um, and of course I've dropped below that now, um, are way lower than South Africa, which has $59.25 billion. Um, closest will be Egypt at $35 billion. And so our leadership, you know, in terms of size you know, of our GDP, of course, is not reflected in the size of our reserves. And the continued... Um, inevitability, so to speak, of um, the central bank defending the Naira um, due to some of the factors that we have already discussed here, which is our excessive propensity to um, import, including importation of finished um, petroleum, um, of petroleum um, for um, domestic consumption, has um, led to a situation in which our reserves are not at the stage or the state or level that we would desire. Um, now, currently, Nigeria's foreign exchange reserve is derived mainly from the proceeds of crude oil production and sales. Um, our external reserves have prior to now reached, you know, as high as $64 billion in 2008 when oil price reached its all-time, all-time high level of $147 per barrel. Now, we are at a stage where even when the oil price increases, as has been doing, as it has been doing in recent times due to partly the Russian-Ukraine um, war, we are no longer able to capitalize this because the volume of petroleum that we are finished with, that we are importing, whose prices are also rising, essentially erodes whatever benefits we could have got. So, 
What are the causes of our gross reserves decline? Continuous forex intervention by the central bank to stabilize the Naira. CBN's efforts to meet dollar demands in the country and reduce pressure on the Naira has forced it to make continuous withdrawals. So, like um, Professor has said, I agree that we are all responsible for this. Um, decline in oil revenue due to suboptimal oil production because, unfortunately, um, even though Nigeria was able to get an increase in its OPEC uh, um, production for 1 point, almost 1.8 million barrels per day in July, up from 1.772 million barrels per day in June, we are not able to take advantage of this because production, unfortunately, continues to drop and has dropped to as low as 1.26 million barrels per day um, due to lingering oil effect um, and other challenges which continue to impede the country's ability to take advantage. So clearly, um, we have reached a stage where we must look beyond oil earnings, and I totally align myself with the um, contributions of the prof as to how we need to stimulate domestic production. Now, obviously, also high cost of importation of refined petroleum products, um, rising fuel subsidy costs, which you know seems to be like a runaway train right now. Um, the seeming lack of political will to actually get our local refineries working, and now uncertainties about the actual takeoff of the Dangote refinery, which is supposed to be the game changer in this space. Um, there has been a sharp spike in our trade deficit. deficit. Um, our trade deficit increased by 175% in the second quarter of 2022. So how can Nigeria increase and appropriately utilize its foreign reserves? Um, countries, you know, examining other countries across the world, you will see that these countries have utilized a combination of methods, such as maintaining a dedicated liquidity portfolio, such as having long-term or investment portfolios um, through their sovereign wealth fund, which we have also initiated we need to actually utilize these vehicles to grow well over time, immunizing their portfolios, um, which is intended to neutralize foreign exchange and interest rate risks, and of course the petroleum fund buffer portfolio, um, similar to the sovereign wealth. Now, it is appropriate that Nigeria follows the path of these countries. But honestly speaking, I do need to emphasize again that we, this is more than um, the best time. If ever, obviously, the, the best time to diversify our revenue sources was um, uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago. The next best time is now. And so, how can we reorganize and restructure? And, and again, I align with Prof. who has talked about the need to restructure you know, our economy and, and, and the challenges with it. How can we restructure our economy so that we can take advantage of opportunities in the agricultural space, for example, in the solid mineral space, for example? How can we retool and equip our teaming masses to become productive? Now, one of the um, only um, good Developments, the, the major positive developments in terms of FDI flows, obviously, and which again Prof has mentioned, has been the significant ones in the venture capital space. Now, this is something that has um, reflected the creativity of our youth, and indeed, our greatest strength will remain the potential of our people. So, we clearly need to make investments in social, I would say social investments that will stimulate labor productivity, that will improve the qualification and the preparation and the ability of our populace and our labor force to generate desired income and revenues for Nigeria. Obviously, also, we need to address the security and other challenges infrastructure and security challenges that are leading to a massive exodus, unfortunately, of our youth, who are the ones who have the capacity, actually, to turn things around for us in terms of productivity. So, if we grow and empower our labor force, 
the private sector, provide increased employment opportunities, enhance the quality of life, enhance social, political, cultural, and economic activities so that we can stem not just the tide of rural urban migration, but also to stem the tide of you know international migration. Some of our labor leaders we have spoken about. Um, Prof mentioned, he said something that I need to report. He said, if you have children, I mean, I, I think I can say that by the grace of God, by virtue of being an entrepreneur and creating employment, not only have my three children returned from abroad, they are gainfully employed within the business of Emerging Africa Capital. And I challenge every um, one of our friends and colleagues to be able to do the same. Create opportunities for Nigeria. <laughs> Thank you. Create opportunities for Nigerians both at home and abroad. Um, so, um, in closing now, so as not to exhaust my time, I do believe that um, there are very strong, very strong challenges ahead of the next administration. Um, these challenges are not challenges that will be met by short-term measures, but will be met by strong political will to create an enabling environment for increased productivity across all relevant sectors, um, to engage the youths and the children who are economically excluded right now significantly and who form the, um, a, a, a bedrock of labor that could be available to turn situations around for Nigeria, embrace governance practices that favor inclusiveness, that um, will support productivity of our youth and our people will stem some of the adverse migration that we have seen and very importantly diversify our revenue sources and our sources of foreign exchange income way beyond oil. So I say let's look beyond oil. Um, personally, I think the oil game is done and dusted. It's as good as we have. Thank you very much for your time and attention. God bless you. Thank you very much. Let's recognize her once again. I told you. She's full of matter. <laughs> and even at Kigali, um, you could see the passion, the commitment. And it's so challenging that she has led by example. Not only has she sent her three kids abroad to get international exposure, but they are back here in Nigeria. That's food for thought. And remember her words? The days of oil is over. The earlier we begin to find the next oil, the better for us. Thank you very much, madam, for that wonderful presentation. Now, while you were speaking, uh, Mrs. Sonny, our chairman for the occasion, the one and only Mr. Festus Kayamo, S-A-N, had signed on. And I told you, if you know the background of Mr. Kayamo, you will know that before he became an SAN, he was an SAM, Senior Advocate of the Masses. A thoroughbred Ghanifa Wehimi protege. He fought in the trenches in the days of autocracy. He has slept in many cells all over Nigeria, but he remains unbowed. He was strategic in the 2019 campaign for the election of the current government and he's part of the government. Mr. Festus Kayamwe say, and it's our pleasure to give you the opportunity online to speak to us now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and I hope um, I have been unmuted. I don't have the protocol list with me here, uh, so I apologize. I cannot go through the protocol list. I just want to crave your indulgence for me to adopt the protocol that have been established. Um, this is essentially just a goodwill message. Um, we have been at the Federal Executive Council today. Uh, I joined the Federal Executive Council virtually too from Warri.
um, to be with you. Uh, I sincerely apologize, but I did send my special advisor to be fiscal by Mr. Davis Olua, and I hope he's there. But I thought it would just be courteous enough, respectful for me, to join virtually and um, send my apologies and, of course, give um, some good messages to this great institute of charter secretaries and administrators of Nigeria. I was um, extremely excited and grateful to have been invited. Uh, being a senior lawyer myself, I am part of you. I'm really part of you. And I just want to appreciate you for guiding institutions, for guiding companies in the right direction in Nigeria, especially um, for them to function within the ambit of the law. And so I want to thank you all. You are my bosses, really, because I've taken a small absence now from practice to go and serve the nation. But I'll be back very soon. <laughs> I will be back very soon to confront some of you in court. Um, so um, just to say, I wish you well. Um, happy deliberations. Um, but may I, may I just take me perhaps just maybe two minutes to talk about job creation in the country and what we are trying to do. Uh, there is no excuse for the, uh, no justifiable, justifiable excuse really for the very high rate of unemployment we have. Uh, the global trends we have, the COVID-19 pandemic, and the fact that we have a global meltdown in terms of um, uh, even the elite economies of the world are going through a lot. It's still not an excuse because we are a very rich nation. So we should be able to harness our natural resources to provide jobs for our people. Um, so what we are trying to do is to look at the, uh, the skill sector. I think that is the, the, the key to unlock, to unlock the uh, unemployment uh, market in Nigeria. If we are waiting for the orthodox approach to employment where people wait for the magic letter of employment, where we have to create spaces in public institutions, about looking at then we are not um, then you are not in tune with what is happening globally what is happening globally is that people acquire skills people are self-employed government provide the necessary environment for them to be self-employed and then uh, skill not the populace empower them after skilling them give them startup packs and let them be self-employed and earn money all over europe and america the the greatest money earners are those who have um, skills the plumbers the carpenters, the um, uh, cobblers, you know, the fashion designers, even in Nigeria now, they earn so much money than those who wait till the end of the month to be paid salaries. So we are concentrating on that. Um, at the level of the Ministry of Labor and our agencies, especially the National Directive of Employment, we have a lot of programs, a lot of programs where we try to skill up Nigerians for them to be, you know, um, um, skilled. But um, to be honest also, to, be, to, to just show a level of honesty in this discussion, you also need a lot of power. You need power, um, constant power supply for the macro, small, and medium-scale ent enterprises to, to try it. And for those entrepreneurs at that level to try it. Without power, adequate power, how can they power their small businesses, their small machines? How can they at that level? So it's like a vicious circle. So, we will do what we have to do on our part. We have different portfolios as public officers, but I think we also need power. Uh, someday, I think uh, the power minister should come and uh, speak uh, to, to Nigerians as to the great efforts they are also making in that direction uh, to, to provide power to Nigerians. So, uh, well, it, it's like a vicious echo, but we will do what we have to do on our part. Scale up Nigerians, concentrate on the macro, small, and medium scale enterprises to see whether we can um, create a lot of jobs for Nigerians at that. Good deliberate. Thank you. The Honorable Minister, thank you very much. I know lawyers are always brief because 
you hold our brief. Thank you very much, sir. We are grateful. Thank you for, in two minutes, telling us what your ministry is doing to address some of the concerns and solutions that Professor uh, Adi has put forward. Upskilling and empowering the macro, medium, small scale enterprises to create more employment. Uh, I think that's uh, very, very interesting. And when people are gainfully employed in that sector, we don't have, when Nigerians, we have skilled carpenters, uh, 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 bricklayers, tilers, we don't have to go to Togo, Senegal, to import them to work for us in this country. Mr. Minister, we are most grateful. Thank you very much. Uh, before I call on the next uh, discussant, which is our own colleague that is right here, Mr. Rufai Kali, please permit me to uh, recognize uh, one or two uh, dignitaries and very important persons that have joined us. Uh, while we are talking, I've introduced her already, an engineer, a philanthropist, a politician, a mother, a voice for the women. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to recognize Hajia Ireti Kengibe. Madam, you are welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Just a minute. Um, I also want to recognize Mr. Damilare Oloba of Gerund Constructions Limited, one of our sponsors for this program. Please, where are you, sir, Mr. Oloba? Thank you very much. We are most grateful. And if you look at the back of the program, you will see the advert there. We are most grateful for supporting this uh, program. Permit me also to recognize the presence of Dr. Emeke Mwabuzo, FCTI. is a council member and is representing the president of CITN, Chief Adedayo Adeshino, MNI, FCTI. So you are welcome. Thank you very, very much. Uh, online, and we are grateful. Um, as we check the online, uh, online we are on top, we are with you. We've noticed that we have over 300 and 76 participants online as of the time we check. And we want to recognize online the presence of Mr. Joshua Adioye, the immediate past chairman of Ixan or your state chapter. You are welcome, sir. And then we also want to uh, recognize the presence online of Otumba Francis Meshioye, FCIS. Uh, uh? Oh, it's right here. Wow. Please, sir, can you stand up and take a bow? Thank you very much. So he's both online and he's physical. <laughs> this is amazing. Thank you very much, sir. Now, let's um, go on then to invite Mr. Rufai Khalid, ACIS, our discuss second discussion. Sir, please, you can make your comments. You can, yes. Thank you. You can. Okay. Good morning, colleagues. Um, I need to express my support for uh, rather coming late. Although I was uh, at the top of the table, I was invited to the office to do some uh, critical assignments. So I, I have lost some part of the discussion, but the part of the discussion that I got uh, is what will interest me more to discuss about, and which is the oil and gas aspect. But the discussions will be very personal because I'm not representing an uh, oil and gas company. to all of us because we are talking about how we manage our sovereign wealth, wealth that concerns each and every one of us. It is also coming at a time when we are transiting 
and I remember the lecture he was echoing and mentioned, mentioning the future challenges that the next dispensation will have. But most importantly, on the governance challenges, as I said, is the hydrocarbon industry, which I want to personally discuss about. And one of the things I had him mention was the that the main challenge we used to have could be from international, the international challenges. Uh, I want to say that on the challenges in the oil and gas industry, which is the bedrock of the external reserve we've been discussing, stems largely national and international. I'm not disagreeing with him, but I want to say that these challenges it evolves around the globe. It's all over. And the dynamism that cuts across will also depend largely from nation to nation. In our own setting, the major challenge we have actually should be national and international. And I give you my reasons. There are quite a number of challenges that we've been having that most other developed or developing countries that I have all these reserves, either you call it the oil reserve or financial reserve or whatever, that do not have. But the most interesting thing is that this government, again I'm not speaking for government, I'm speaking for myself, has made numerous promulgations that are meant to address the recurring challenges that are taking us to where we are today. I know it is already within the public domain that we have the Petroleum Industry Act, for instance. The most difficult thing about this promulgation is to have them. The moment you have these promulgations, you can continue to tinker with them over a period until you satisfactorily get what you want. Gentlemen, this is a bill that has been around since 2008. And if you are going back, you can go to as far as 1967. But finally, on August 16, we heard that we now have a bill called the Petroleum Industry Bill. The main essence of that bill is to address most of the recurring challenges that the lecturer has mentioned. Most important of which is ensuring transparency and accountability in our way of doing business. And to also build on these reserves, to reduce corruption and to do so many things. And it is the same PIA that gave us the NMPC Limited, which will showcase the distinctiveness in us as a limited liability company, um, which company will be guided by Companies and Allied Matters Act. All these are within the public domain. So, talking about the challenges, as I said, I, I, I don't want to castigate or cast aspersions on anybody. But we know as a fact that one of the major challenges we have with our proving reserves is the tampering of those reserves. The reserves are not purely accounted for because there has always been infractions around them. So, yes, we have open quarter, we have a particular margin that we need to attain, but this recurring challenge, which is a security challenge, has been around us and has been disturbing us from attaining the desired goal. So that is also a national challenge a challenge that we don't see in other developed or developing countries. It's a very, very uh, serious challenge. And in the course of these discussions, as much as we're saying hydrocarbon industry is a major source of our reserve, we may also open up this discussion and see how we could evolve around it to provide possible solutions to it. But as I said, on the part of government, the PIA and the CAMA are the two important documents that will ensure this transparency as well as significant increase in our reserves as well as our independence.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Khalid, for drawing attention to something that should be of um, serious concern to all of us, the security challenges the nation is currently facing to the extent that we can't even meet our OPEC quota. I think just this year, Angola took over from Nigeria as Africa's biggest oil exporter. The reserves are there, but most of the pipelines are vandalized. A lot of illegal refining going on. And we can see the impact it's having on the whole nation. Hopefully, um, efforts will need to be intensified to see how this issue is addressed, both strategically and on the ground. Thank you for making those uh, personal contributions. We are grateful. Before we go to the next item, which is um, uh, questions and uh, answers from here, as well as online, uh, permit me to um, ask Dr. King's Jack of the BOI. Mr. Dr. Jack, are you here? Yes, please. Um, to step forward, please, can we get a microphone for him uh, to make a contribution? Please, you can add the base. Thank you. Yes, Starting to um, most years, they, on a daily basis, we see its impact in the activities of businesses and households in the country. So it's a topic that I believe was well chosen at this point in time because it contributes to, in my opinion, over 90% of the cost of inflation in this country. And that has a direct relationship with When you take a business 10 years ago and it takes that same business today and take a look at it, the impact uh, external reserve or the fluctuations in external reserve, these are these impacts on the value of the Naira currency as an add on that business, you will come to appreciate it. When you also take a look at it, when you compare it to the level of consumer participation in the economy, that is you and I, our buying power, um, 10, 15 years ago, and compared to now, you also appreciate that the topic of today is what you and I should pay utmost interest. I will quickly paint a picture before I leave, because I was just called upon to say one or two things. So I'll quickly paint the picture before I leave. I first visited Dubai. Um, I'm being the fact that I'm working for government. There are some limits I cannot cross, definitely. But I first went to Dubai in 2006 for a business trip. In that trip, I realized that I, don't, I think the exchange rate was 110 naira to a dollar. At that trip, I realized that the exchange rate of the Dubai and Durham to the dollar was 3.3. At that time, the only city in Dubai was Dora, that we know today that is called the old city. Fast forward down the line, 2022, Dubai has become a world-class city of infrastructure. 
as of 2006, Dubai was just like Nigeria, a crude oil export dependent country. But year after year, it was building two things human capital. So today you will see Dubai citizens, female and male, competing world class in human capital index. It was building infrastructure that will enable cost of production or cost, production cost, to be minimal. It was building security infrastructure that will give you an eye, the confidence to be able to do business in Dubai. Fast forward again to 2022. Dubai does not need to ask you to come and invest in Dubai. You will have to go to Dubai to invest. So gradually, Dubai is becoming, for just maintaining a stable currency by the dynamics of what we talked about today, um, of our foreign, our foreign uh, reserve, Dubai is able to attract businesses. And Dubai is gradually becoming a production hub in the Middle East. Nigeria also will have to we don't need to go begging anybody. We are a population of 200 million people. If we have the certain indices I've talked about right, of building the right infrastructure that will bring down, Prof talked about the marginal cost of production, that will bring down the mar marginal cost of production of a good to a competitive level, we will see the businesses work to us. And finally, we as citizens also we have role to play. Bank of Industry in 2015 took a decision to, as part of his attire for office for work, make made in Nigerian clothing a part. Prof also made mention made mention of that. If you take a look at all of us here, most likely 90% of us are wearing imported wares. That is the area we can also influence the impact of. Foreign Exchange Reserve. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jack. And um, on behalf of Ixan, we want to recognize the great role that the BOI is playing to empower small, macro, small, and medium scale enterprises with stable liquidity. At such a time where the average lending rate is 30% plus in the streets. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, before we uh, continue, I think it's important at this point, we have been, apart from Mrs. Sonny, we have been hearing a lot of masculine voices. And I'm sure Hajia is listening to me. Hajia, please, can you come forward to give us your good word message? Just three minutes will be okay. Thank you very much, madam. Please, yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon, distinguished guests, professional colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and all other protocols observed. First of all, I must say I'm honored to have been invited by this esteemed Institute of um, Chartered Accountants and Administrators of Nigeria to deliver this message. And after listening to Professor Adi, uh, Professor Adi, uh, Mr. Khalid, and Mrs. It has been very, very enlightening. We all know the problems, but we also know the solutions part of our problem has always been implementation. As um, the doctor from BOI said, yes, they do give me small business loans, but without proper policies. For instance, you give a, a, a woman money for a bakery. She's, she has her bakery money she got from the industry. She's trying to get it done. Local governments will land every week and say, uh, you have to pay tariff for television in the bakery. You have to do this. You have to do that. And you know all the problems. The high cost of everything. And she's having to deal with extortion on a regular basis from local government um, I don't know what regulatory agencies, apart from all the other ones. 
Well, what I'm going to say here today is, I don't have to tell you that, yes, we all want this country to change. Can all the professionals here think of all you can contribute? But you're not going to get far without good governance and good leadership and good policies. That's the truth. We have just entered another election year, and I was like everybody else. I don't. I wasn't even registered to vote. I don't know who my ward chairman is. I don't know the local government chairman because, as far as I'm concerned, I'm an engineer. It's not my concern. That's not true. It's everybody's concern, regardless of what your profession is. So I am telling you all that for this country to move forward, we need the criti critical mass, and that means all of you getting involved in one form or another. I'm not advising everybody to run. We all can't run for offices, but we can all get involved. You can find out what your choices are, who are the better people, work for them, campaign for them. You don't have to give them money. Just make sure you get involved in who your leaders are. Now, the first thing that you have to do for that to happen, you have to be registered to vote. Then, you can now get involved in the process. I'm not going to take up much of your time. I'm glad to see that we have lots of solution providers, but we need the framework for those solutions to be implemented. Thank you very much for inviting me, and I'm, I'm impressed that you do do this. You've been doing it for 22 years, and I hope you do invite me to further lectures. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. We are very grateful. We need to re-engineer our political space. And listening to you is very clear what is very dear to my heart. Solutions are of no use if they are not implemented, which is why at Ipsum we prioritize progress as opposed to perfection. We will never get perfect, but we need to make progress. And uh, we believe that post this meeting, uh, extensive engagements have commenced, and it will then continue. Uh, so that there were two words that were used by our guest speaker, as well as Mr. Kali. They talk about accountability and responsibility. Incidentally, those two words are found in the IMF guidelines for managing of external reserves. So we need to hold people accountable, responsible, and they need to be transparent on how they manage the foreign reserve. Thank you once again for drawing our attention that we all have a role to play. Uh, before we continue to the Q&A session, please, I would like to recognize some other very important persons that have been with us. Uh, please join me to welcome our uh, immediate past registrar, Mrs. Nkechi Onyenso. Madam, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, we have here with us a very learned gentleman, Mr. Ephraim Olushola Oluwanuga. He's the chairman, Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, United Kingdom, Abuja branch. You are very much welcome, sir. Join me also to welcome Mr. Duro Falori, who is his FCIS, the past chairman, Iksan, Abuja chapter as well as Mrs. Bolaji Gabari, FCIS, immediate past chairman, Iksan Abuja as well. Gentlemen, you are welcome. Thank you. Uh, I think we now need to go to, in the interest of time, we need to move to the Q&A session. Why uh, we are getting uh, ready for that, we also want to recognize our sponsors, Limited. Thank you very much. Abuja Property Development Limited, we are very grateful. As well as Abuja Investment Company Limited, thank you very much. Abuja Market Management Limited, and of course the Bank of Industries. Thank you, gentlemen, and every one of you for supporting this laudable uh, uh, program. Uh, now we need to go to a question and answer session. So, in the interest of time, please. If you have a question, um, we would like you, first of all, let's start with a live audience. You will raise your hand. If you are given an opportunity, please go straight to the point. Tell us who you are and where you are from, and do go straight to the point. 
um, please, our hosts and hostesses with the roving mic, can we be on standby? There are two of them. Uh, so that then we will go online as well to take comments and questions from there. Now is your time to respond. Yes, please. You have questions? Can I see your, your comments? Yes, I can see a hand up at the back. I see another hand. Okay. Um, Hosea, uh, Hosea, can we yes, say to the lady behind you? Thank you. Please, in the interest of this, if you can step forward uh, because of the way the hall is arranged so that we can see you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I still get uh, uh, members of the IFSAN and everybody who has worked together to put up this program. Um, the keynote speaker, I want to say thank you. I really learned a lot from today. Um, I have a comment and a question. So I'll start first with the question. Um, I want to talk about the human capital, the human resources part of what we discussed today. It's, um, it's essential that when companies recruit and they get um, staff and employees, that they also, everybody wants to add value to whatever company or establishment they're employed in. So I'm also looking at the aspect of the company adding value to the employees as well. Because if I, for example, as an employee, I have in mind that this company that I'm working for, tirelessly for, has my interest at heart, I don't think anybody will be thinking about leaving the company, more so leaving the country as it is. Because when you start from the grassroots, which is the company itself and the individuals in the company, when you please your employees, when you satisfy their urge, to also, it also motivates them to make more inputs in your company. So what I want to say is, first of all, as I know there are a lot of companies and recruiters here, what measures have you put in place to make sure that you, not you don't just recruit staff, but you sustain them, you maintain them? Some of us are interested in personal development, but we are not just interested in personal development. What about the incentives that come from being your staff? We need to know that we are being taken care of as much as we are taking care of your establishment. As, um, I want to just give a little example. I went for... I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Time, okay, okay, okay. Yep. This is one aspect of what I want to see. And um, secondly, I want to talk about the production aspect of discussion today coming from the grassroots again from where there are lots of entrepreneurs here um, clothes vendors um, makeup parties whatever have you what is the government doing to sustain these businesses for example in Abuja now there is frail scarcity you can barely run your generator because there is no there isn't even power supply from AEDC so what are we doing to encourage these small businesses to make them continue to produce to increase the GDP and to stay in Nigeria because if I look and the, the economy is not favorable I might as well leave so these are my questions thank you Okay, uh, good afternoon, Hal. Your name, please. And please, can you limit your question to the issue at hand, which is okay. talking about uh, standard results, the dynamics, and the governance challenges, please? Thank you very much. Yes. My name is Akim Kolawali Adorogba, uh, a potential member. Okay. Uh, I have two questions, one for Prof and one for Mr. Khalid. One, sir, uh, to the professor, with so many expertise that we have in the Nigeria today, I mean the economists, uh, if 
they are invited to the government to serve as minister or advisor, as our economic advisor. We hardly feel their impact in the government. What are actually responsible for this? That's one. Then to Mr. Khalid, is it possible for our refineries to work at all or not? What is responsible for our inability to operate our refineries, four refineries in Nigeria? When do we intend to stop importation of refined products? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we thank you all as on your commitment as a potential member. Please register today before you leave. All right. Thank you very much. Let's um, before I go online, let's take one more question from this side. Yes, please, the gentleman this side. Okay. Thank you. I'm Sholai Fremolu Wanoga. Um, external Reserve Dynamics Governance Challenges. As at last year, there was an arbitration award against Nigeria. It was going to take about $9 billion of our external reserve. Thank God that we appealed against it and we're in court on it. My question is that since 2007, we've had a law before the National Assembly on rejigging arbitration uh, in Nigeria. Thank God it has gone through the National Assembly, the Senate, and the, the House of Rep. My question is, Mr. President, and I'm sending this question through the Honorable Minister, when are you going to ascend to this, to this bill, for God's sake? so that Nigerian arbitration sector will begin to, will be revived, and our, our external reserve will not be depleted. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mwenda, for those questions. Uh, in the interest of time, I think um, we'll go to our resource persons. Oh, yes, okay. sir. All right, thank you. I, I'm happy the last question wasn't directed <laughs> at, at us. <laughs> so that's the main thing. I have nothing to say about that. But somehow I know about the, the judgment against Nigeria. Um, yeah, I think that's classified. Let me leave that there. Um, on the, the, the uh, second to the last speaker, uh, you asked the question about economic advisors when they go to government, nobody feels their impact. Actually, uh, Dr. Doreen Salami is my senior colleague at Lagos Business School. <laughs> He's now the chief economic advisor to the president. And since he went there, I've not even seen him. <laughs> so, and we don't hear his voice any longer. But you know how it is with government. Um, president has all the, I mean, it's at his discretion. They may give him suggestions and uh, tell him what they think is um, appropriate to do. But then, of course, you know there are a lot of uh, political interests as well. So he has to balance all of that. So um, I wouldn't say that um, he's not impactful or that um, you know, the role of uh, that office is not impactful. It is. It depends on how we look at it. Then the, the lady who was asking about, I mean, talking about what sort of incentive. I would like to share what I heard from Michel Lelebwe, the CEO of uh, InterSwitch, last week when we had that session that I mentioned what I was speaking. Um, when he observed that his, uh, his, his uh, staff were living in droves, so he set up a new policy. Some, some, some of us would have read it online as well. InterSwitch now pays uh, the spouses of their staff. Right, they pay them significant, uh, you know, about 70% of their basic salary, okay? And then they also, if, if they're in Nigeria, uh, they take care of, uh, of so many things, you know, in addition to all those statutory, you know, health, whatever, whatever, insurance, okay? But if they are abroad, Okay, in order to incentivize them not to leave InterSwitch, they also take care of their taxes abroad. Yeah, so if you see, well, this is something, it's an innovation. Uh, they say that necessity is a mother of invention. Simply because he has lost enormous um, uh, amount of uh, resources, training people, and then having them leave him. 
So it, they now have to be forced, compelled to devise uh, this means to keep them uh, with him. So that is what some companies can do. Um, what w the point you raise is a very uh, important one, yes. Um, the treatment of workers is something that needs to be looked into. I, I mean, after all, the university lecturers are still on strike. They're still at home. So that's part of what we're talking about. Okay, I also want to build on what the professor has said uh, with respect to the question asked by the lady on employment. And what I want to say is that employer-employee relationship is contractual. It's a contract, isn't it? We have the labor laws, we have the constitution, we have the pension laws, we have the Workman Compensation Act. We have all sorts of promulgations that are meant to give you the protection you deserve. And then you have the internal rules. So if you are looking for a job and you decide to narrow your choice to a particular organization, it behoves of you also to go through their manual and to see working condition or condition of employment. Because you are going into a contract. Now we have the industrial courts, and the industrial courts are aimed to even protect you more. I would never sit here and call industrial court a bias court. Never. I will never say so. But as an employer, if you take this to your grievance to the court, the court will go as far as the grand norm, which is the Constitution. Because even the Constitution has given you adequate protection in terms of all the fundamental rights. Those rights are attributable mostly to employer-employee. Maybe you have not been heard and you were dismissed. Then the fundamental human right with respect to right to fair hearing will be invoked. So what you do is you look at the practices and procedures, the conditions of service. Although when you get to court, when there are contradictions between the internal rules and the labor laws on the course of the Constitution, what will prevail is what? Is the, is the Constitution. So, and unfortunately, these are some of the infractions that we've been having from various multinational companies, where you have internal rules that will always, almost turn you to a slave. So when you go to court, the court will just discountenance those rules and look at what exactly the labor law has said. So if you want an improved condition of service and you're not happy, Make sure you are handy with the conditions of service. Then someone was asking about the refineries. Um, as I said, I'm not here on behalf of NNPC at all. But I have worked in the refinery for 20 years, so I, I should be able to build a refinery. And I should be able to speak about the refinery. The only thing I will tell you personally is that there's a robust work going on in rehabilitating refineries. And all the speculations you hear about money expended and all that, most of them are actually uh, unfounded. Each refinery has its own peculiar problem. Maybe one has turbines for them, power problems. Another one may have the reforming, another one may have funding or distribution. But I haven't seen any government that has robustly put its effort in putting these refineries in place more than this present government. And when I say this government, I mean the federal government as well as NMPC, although I'm not here to speak on their behalf. So uh, uh, that's all I will tell you, but I don't think I will be graphic. I'll, I don't think I will be graphic to tell you the level of improvement being done. But if you want to see the improvement, walk to LMA, go to Potako refinery. That refinery produces about 210,000 barrels every day. 150 for the old refinery and the 60 for the new refinery. The 1965 and then the one that was uh, built in to accommodate 60,000. If you want to see what's happening in Wari with 110,000 barrels per day, you go to Wari, you see. You want to see what's happening in Kaduna, 125,000 barrels. I mean, you just go there, you see. But as I said, uh, I will not go into these details because um, I'm not representing government or NMPC <laughs> in this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Yeah. We, we appreciate that. Thank you so much. We appreciate Thank that. you. Yeah. As, as we, has any appointed our ladies and gentlemen, 
we are not here to point fingers. We are here to be brutally honest with ourselves that something is not working in our country. And we should determine to find, as Hajia Kenkibe reminded us, we should implement the solutions. Take, for example, what Mr. Khalid said. In the spirit of transparency, if there is a chart available to everybody showing how much barrels of crude oil is being refined by the refineries, everybody can check and look. Just like you don't need to go and call somebody to know what the stock market is doing. The NGS has a platform that shows what is the price of stock every day. We are looking for such level of transparency in managing the key sectors of our economy. We shouldn't bring up our children and tell them this story because they may not even be here to listen. They have all naturalized in Australia and all over the world. I think this is very important. Ladies and gentlemen, we have other very important uh, dignities that have joined us here. Please join me to recognize Honorable Samson Osagie, uh, the former minority whip of the House of Representatives and Chairman, African Bar Association, Nigerian Forum. Sir, you are welcome. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome, sir. Thank you. Um, before I go online, I would like to once again recognize Manasen G. Rubainu, who FWAPC, who is the first deputy president of the Association of Professional Bodies of Nigeria. So you are welcome once again. And can you please uh, give us a few words in terms of uh, goodwill message? Thank you, sir. Please, can we make the microphone closer? Host, please, can we? Thank you very much. We are standing on the existing protocol. I want to say without wasting time that Ixan is one of the member bodies of the Association of Medical Professional Bodies of Nigeria, in whom we are well pleased. Um, this is my second time being in their premises. Um, a few months ago, they hosted the board meeting um, of the association in Lagos. That was the first time I've been in the premises and it looked very nice, very good. They treated us very well. And um, I can say that the president of this time was very attractive, flamboyant, and really very accommodating person. I believe that is the nature of members of this profession. So, Thank you very much, also, for inviting us to come to this activity. And let me just say, professions are created by society. So, you and on behalf of society. That's why all professions are service oriented. And what I saw here today, I will relate back to the President. I can see that every information here was done well and on behalf of society to get Nigerian society a better place. And it is well spoken. And I may just just reiterate what Hajjah Pindiba said. We must be very, 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 very objective and we must have a very wide approach to all our problems. Governance is the captain of what the professor said. He gave us after the period of time when Nigeria was at the best of the people and after some time they left. Which means the leadership of that country. The structure of this country. These tissues of governance are all very important before we can even put the economic systems and things that will help support the society. And I pray that 
that we have today will be a very good challenge. I sometimes wonder if we have our patriotic systems. I'm sure if my own my very own my own we will still have our textile, our cotton production, our whatever, our cotton will still be there. But maybe it's because we dissolved all these and formed a unitary government. And therefore, we lost all the necessary things God has given us. Let us think positively for this country. And as professionals, we are meant by society to work for society and to make sure society becomes a good place. I want to thank you very much for inviting APBM. It's a pleasure being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, sir. Uh, let me go to the online audience. Uh, I can assure you we have a plethora of comments and a number of questions. Um, I want to Olekama Ekelema, FCIS, say, hmm, have truth been released yet? Our mentality, our mindset need to change. And for Chupa Dewale at Tenugu, he said, wow, sovereign lecture. I hope we can distill this to the masses of our people. Uh, there's a question from Augustine uh, Atrigo. He said, well done, Prof. Pongo Adi, for your very factual lecture on Nigeria's economic standing with emphasis on external reserve. Can you please expatiate on the role management plays in creating a sustainable external reserve and how Nigeria is faring on management of our economy, especially in creating the right environment for growth in external reserve. Prof, they want to know the role management plays. Let me just read a few more before you answer. Uh, somebody says, uh, Cecilia Madweke says, hmm, we need a paradigm shift. And um, um, very insightful, Prof, thanks for this lecture, honestly. Very apt indeed. Well done, sir. Uh, thank you, Prof. Adi. Different comments. Uh, I think the next question, uh, somebody, Jessica Okoli, said, we go and meet our prospective strategic partners and investors not sitting down in Nigeria waiting for them to come and meet us. That is political entrepreneurship. Very, very, very interesting. So, Prof, can you speak to the truth of how management can help Okay, so um, I think uh, the template, uh, if I may say, in the news that is already provided in 2007, uh, uh, the financial reforms, the fiscal reforms that um, happened during the Jonathan administration, and they are still um, you know, in, in operation. So, yes, but again, so it has to do with the agency of the moment. Um, the central bank, uh, go, so when you talk about management of the federal reserve, uh, is the sole creature of the CBN. So that is it. So and the CBN is an independent entity. Uh, what it, what can happen is to use uh, the, like the fiscal reforms, uh, the macroeconomic reforms. To put some kind of benchmark on what has to be done, um, how it should be uh, utilized. Okay, uh, but again, uh, the, the, the the responsibility of the central bank, the, the monetary policy that they pursued, is inflation target for a very long time. So each time it is observed that inflation is beginning to shoot up. The next thing is to do, use monetary instruments to contain that. And then inflation, of course, has a different effect on the interest rate. The first, when they tried the one NPR, the monetary policy rate, okay, and still is there, I'm saying that it's not working. The next thing is now to look at you know, intervention in the foreign exchange market. Just think about the situation we are in now. I was listening to the radio when I was coming from the airport this morning. Some people were you know, screaming, you know, threatening 
But if you stay at home, uh, uh, writing TikTok and uh, changing WhatsApp messages about the travels of our country, you're not going to get anywhere. But we believe that each time is a great opportunity for you to develop another skill set that will take you not just in Nigeria here, but everywhere in the world. And let me just make the point that traveling abroad is not an issue. It is what we're going to learn. Because you can't leave opportunity to be a professor in Nigeria and be a big man in a school in Paris. Okay. You have destroyed your future. So let's be very clear about what we are doing. Those who go abroad, the Chinese and the Indians, they go there with a purpose. They bring back things to their country and they make their country better. A lot of Nigerians acting in the streets of London and New York claiming that they are abroad. We don't want that any longer. We want intentional strategic travel that will make a difference. And I want to remind you that if you go there and get involved in crime, it destroys not only you, it destroys the reputation of this country. That is something we need to be at mind. Thank you very much. Are we ready for the time? Are we ready? Thank you very much. Uh, to present the block to the to present the block to the chairman of this occasion, our own Mr. Professor Kiyama Excellent, the Rebel Minister of State and the Labour and Employment Ministry, will be the start of the day that we will have this subject. On behalf of the President and Council of History of Chara Services and Administrators of Nigeria, I am presenting this token to a uh, flag to uh, the chairman of this location, which is represented by himself, and uh, the double representation of the body was there. That you on the on the stool uh, to talk to us. So thank you very much. Qualified for that first, uh, an honorary member of the Power of Life. So, give me the form. Don't cut the darkness. Light the candle. That is it. We appreciate you for adding the body of knowledge to 
on behalf of the President of the Data Link of Secretary of Scribbles, I have the pleasure to present to you. Thank you so much. I will then like to call upon our common dear Dr. Adele Kanasa, SIS, to do the presentation for the Sixth Summit. Since you think you got me, we are going to invite <laughs> the representative of the president of Mrs. Akiola on the show today, SPIS. And you can see the little bit of her receive on our behalf. Thank you very much. It's very interesting because Adela is my abode. <laughs> so, on behalf of the President and Council, on behalf of Papa Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, we like to present to you this plaque of recognition for your contribution to the progress of the Institute and Nigeria as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan, for doing us that honor. Uh, finally, I would like to invite you to the podium, Mr. Jacqueline Ozier, to make a presentation to Mr. Hassan. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Kali, uh, we appreciate the fact that you were on the hot seat and needed to express yourself personally and not the official position of your organization. You struggled with it, um, quite controversial, but you were able to speak your mind. On behalf of the Institute, my president, and my entire colleagues, it is my honor to present to you this talk in appreciation of your adding to the body of knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your right attention. Uh, I'm going to say that I'm going to make some important Before we go in, I would like to recognize a group of people who 
I'm the chairman of the Publicity and Advocacy Committee. My name is Linda or Natalie FCRS. Um, and the vice chairman of the committee, Dr. Wahid or Lavidi ACIS. Please give them a round of applause. They work tirelessly to ensure that this program is a success. And um, we have other members of the committee, Mrs. Adeyewu Adeyewa. Or by a woman. She knows I'm always biting my tongue when I call her name. So, apologies. Please, uh, um, she's here today. Um, ACIS, she's a member. Please give her a round of applause. Um, we have Dr. Fati Lizu, ACIS, um, who is a member. Most of the uh, members of the Publicity and Advocacy Committee are in Lagos. Most of them are um, logged in online. We have just a couple of them here in Abuja. Um, Mrs. Adapu Amadi, ACIS, is a member. We have Mr. Bolaji Adegoke, ACIS, also a member. Mrs. Yvette Okwesi, FCIS, is a member. Mrs. Adeola Olumeyo, ACIS, is a member. Mrs. Maureen Otibo, FCIS, is a member. Um, Ms. Julie Bassi, ACIS, is the secretary to the committee. And the last group of People I'm going to recognize today, they are all here. I would like to um, to recognize them personally, uh, physically, because they are here. So if I call you, I'd like you to quickly um, come forward for recognition. And the first person is the chairman of the... Um, okay, so the group is the, uh, the members of the local organizing committee. Like I said, most of the members of the Publicity and Advocacy Committee are based in Lagos. So we have a local organizing committee who have worked to make this an excellent event, and we're so grateful to them. And the chairman of that committee, the powerhouse of that committee, Mr. Babatunde Pelewura, FCIS. Please give him a resounding applause. We also have in that committee, Mrs. Marilyn Eze, FCIS. She's not here today. She's out of the country, um, but her contributions were quite felt. Um, we have Mr. Adedeji, Adebi, ACIS. He's also the chairman of the Abuja chapter of ICSAN. He's the secretary to the committee. He's right over there. He's uh, um, right at the corner there. And Mrs. Abeyuwa Oba. You wanna, over you wanna is here. I have to go to school to learn to pronounce that name. <laughs> so she's right here. Please give her a round of applause. Then we have Mrs. Adaku Amadi, ACIS. She's also here. Mrs. Tony Bashir, ACIS, um, is here. She's coming down. So these group of people are those that have worked, they have worked, and if I say they have worked, and they are still working, to make sure that this event was, is the huge success that it is. Please, once again, give them a rousing applause. Thank you all. God bless you. Thank you, LOC. We are grateful to you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are on countdown to the close of this very important uh, public discourse from the capital city, Abuja. But before we round up, we have one or two uh, uh, very important aspects of this program we need to do. Um, it takes me to the unveiling of uh, some publications and materials by the Institute. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention, please? Ladies and gentlemen, we will like to formally launch 
the fourth volume of the Institute's Journal of Corporate Governance. And want to express our gratitude to the Publication Committee for making sure that we have a material relevant for such an occasion like this. To lead in this aspect of the program, I would like to invite Mr. President, Mr. Taiwo Benga Owokolade, FCIS, as well as all the council members present to formally launch this volume. Thank you. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, it cannot be that each such is seen as an exclusive body. We would like to invite Professor Bongo Ade, as well as the special advisor to the minister, and Mr. Kali to, to stay down and join in the launching of this journal. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Please, can you step down and join in this of course occasion? Well, I'm going to do three items Well, this is the first aspect of it, so that we don't take a couple to stay so long. As an institute that is the forefront of teaching knowledge, what we really start to do every time is to come up with what we come up with us to access all of these issues. Go through them, get more knowledge, get more information, and then maybe when you want to take a level of truth and make it more number. I know that the big program already got me to come back and be able to do it.
Of volume four of the corporate governance and administration journal. Now we're going to do the public presentation of the stamp, the professional stamp. Thank you. The unveiling of the practitioner stamps. In Ixan, we have practitioners who are. Licensed by Ixa, they are certified, and this is uh, a seal Nils, I've seen to it. show that the other professor Nils. We need you now. Um, Members are coming across. We can't overspeak about it, but the more of the opportunity you get to interface with us, the better for as many of us as possible. And one of those things that we pride ourselves in is that we are the foremost corporate governance institute, and um, we've come to this extent whereby how do you differentiate us from other professional bodies? The meaning is that when we do our job, we find a means to sign in off. We have a means of stamping those jo jobs and, and, and sealing it. So when you see those, those stamp and seal, you know that these are the governance persons. Kava is clear. It's giving us some very statutory responsibilities that we need to basically do. Um, those normal old ones, registration of businesses and all of those ones, those are just the basic ones. Uh, we've got into the extent of board evaluation and all of those issues that are compulsory for organizations to do. We are in the forefront of pushing those initiatives. We're also on the board of CAC to tell you how, how significant our, our institute is. So this year, we came to the extent of saying, let's have a stamp and seal so that when our jobs are done, when you see those, those stamps, you know, oh, these are the governance professionals. We launched this in Lagos, but this is Abuja, the Federal Capital Territory. The purpose why I invited you, sir, is because Niels has a very significant relationship with us. So you need to keep understanding where we've come from and where we are going. And the prof, this is a day of grace. Lagos Business School 
should find a means of ensuring that if they have a relationship with us, then you need to ask yourself, what other body? So, so I am, I am. It's not, a, it's not a Greek gift, you, but it's a, <laughs> it's a commitment for you to say, oh, when they were unveiling. Was a, yeah. The committee that spreaded this assignment, we also have the chairman in the house. And that's Mr. Francis Olawali, FCIS. He's also a member of the council. That committee worked tirelessly towards ensuring that we get this. And then we also have the board of mentors. Many of, many of them are online. But we have uh, their past treasurer of the institute, Otumba Francis Meshioli, FCIS, who is also a member of the board of mentors. Otumba, please extend our great greetings to all of the other members of that, of that board. They work so, so well towards getting this done. I think we are good to go. Okay. Again, on behalf of the Institute of Chartered Secretary and Administrators of Nigeria, I, Chai Wugwengawo, Kaladi FCIS, the 28th president and chairman in council of the institute, ably supported by all other council members in the house, hereby present these to the general public for the usage of our institute and continuation of business going forward. Thank you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, I can see a lot of networking <laughs> going on. Attention, please. Attention, please. We would like to formally bring the event to a close, and then the networking can continue uh, as long as we like. And to do that for us, I would like to call up to the stage our one and only vice president, Mrs. Fumi Ekundayo, FCIS. <laughs> Please, madam, can you do step up so that you can give us a vote of thanks and we can formally close the meeting and then the networking can continue. Thank you. Attention, please. Please, can we for a moment uh, take our seats so that we can round up, so that we can have the vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Please, can we take our seats, ladies and gentlemen? Please, can we take our seats so that the vice president can give our vote of thanks? Thank you very much. Please, can we take our seats?
Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, everyone. Let me follow in the footsteps of the professor. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, now I have your attention. It's been a wonderful day. It's been an amazing public lecture for us today. We're really delighted that we're able to do this in a full physical fa uh, fashion and also with our online participants. You would agree with me that it's been amazing. The discussion has been robust. The discussion has been insightful. Some very thought-provoking uh, discourse has happened here. And I believe that each and every one of us are glad that we made it to this public lecture. And on that note, I'd like you to just put your hands together and appreciate yourselves. All right, my assignment here is very simple. I'm here to say thank you on behalf of the President and Chairman of Council, Mr. Taiwo Gwengawa Kalade, the entire Council members of Ixan and all the members of Ixan. We'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us this, after this morning, now afternoon, we're in afternoon already. You've been a very patient audience and you've been very, very um, attentive all through. We do appreciate both those who are here in this hall with us and also the online participants. Um, so this is just an opportunity to appreciate each and every one. But um, it's also very important to give honor to whom honor is due. So I'm going to be uh, mentioning a few names to thank specifically for the role that they have played in making this public lecture a success. And I'll start with no other than the chairman of today's occasion who joined us uh, virtually and is also here ably represented. I'm talking about no other than uh, the Honorable Minister for State, Labor and Employment, uh, Mr. Festus Keyamo, SAN, who is also ably represented by Mr. Dave Olua, a special advisor. Thank you so much, sir, for taking time. Yes, please appreciate him. Thank you very much. Our keynote speaker, hmm. Professor Bongo Adi, faculty of uh, Lagos Business School. I think what the professor did for us at today's lecture was to crunch a whole module <laughs> for us. That was really, really, really exciting, and I believe a lot of takeaways. And we also look forward to receiving those uh, nuggets that you promised to share with us. Thank you so very much, Prof, for sharing your thoughts with us and also for sharing your depth of knowledge with us. We do appreciate. To our discussants, um, Mrs. Toy Insani, who joined us from Rwanda. Mrs. Toy Insani is uh, also a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators. And I must say my own very mentor, an amazing woman, we say thank you so much for finding the time, uh, despite your location, to be with us today and for sharing your thoughts with us. Again, quite thought-provoking, all that you shared with us. We do appreciate it. Also, um, Mr. Rufai Khalid, ACIS, the GM Litigation, Property and Environmental Law Department, NNPC. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for the repeated reminder that you were talking to us in your personal capacity. We really appreciate your candor. Thank you so much. All right, Ajia is no longer in the house. We also like to appreciate her coming and for the brief thoughts that she shared with us. Ajia Ereti Kingibe. We have, um, we have to recognize and appreciate the DG of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Dr. Lamido Yuguda. Um, I believe I saw a couple of faces from the exchange earlier on. I don't know if they're still around. Please mention the highest regards of the Institute to the DG on our behalf. Okay. Um, Mrs. Victoria Irabo, she had been earlier recognized. She's no longer here with us, but we also appreciate her coming and all of her support uh, towards this uh, public lecture. The chairman of Ixan, Abuja, and Lagos State Chapters, Mr. Ayode Jadebi, ACIS, and Mr. Femi Shukon, FCIS, thank you so much. You are well recognized once again. Our own Dr. George Ekungu, ACIS, who is also one of us, um, he was here earlier on, and then he whispered to me that uh, duty called uh, impromptu, and he had to leave. We appreciate him for uh, 
um, showing his solidarity despite the exigencies of office. To all the council members here present and also online, we appreciate your coming in your numbers. Please appreciate yourselves. Please help us appreciate our council members. Thank you so much. Past presidents who have joined us online and who are still um, online with us, we appreciate you and your continuous support. The DG of the National Institute of Legislative and Democratic Studies, National Assembly, Professor Sulaiman Abubakar, ably represented here by Dr. Kabir Ahmed, Director of Administration and Human Resources. Thank you so much, sir. We appreciate your coming, and uh, you've also been very patient. Thank you. Um, earlier on, Dr. King Jack was here to uh, share brief thoughts with us. He's regional manager, North Central Region Bank of Industry. Thank you so much for coming and for identifying with the public lecture today. Mr. Monday Aje, Chairman, MBA Buari Branch. Thank you. Mr. Idowubelo, Group MD, Dumbbell Investment Group. Thank you for coming. Dr. Emeke Nwabweze, FCTI, representing Chief Ade Dayadeshino, President of CITN. Thank you very much. Mr. Joshua Adeoye, he was earlier recognized as the past chairman of Oyo State Chapter. Mr. Joshua Adeoye, FCIS. We also have, um, we would li also like to recognize and appreciate the DG of the Nigerian Law School, Abuja, Professor Issa Chiroma. Uh, we like to recognize and appreciate our sponsors. Mr. Khalid Rufai, ACIS, Mr. Yabo Hakmed, ACIS, Geronde Constructions Limited, Abuja Property Development Limited, Abuja Investments Company Limited, Abuja Market Management Limited, and the Bank of Industry. Please, can you appreciate our sponsors? Thank you. Thank you for your worthy sponsorship. We appreciate your support for today's public lecture. Of course, the Publicity and Advocacy Committee had earlier been appreciated, but I can't leave them out of my list because um, they were the engine room behind the entire success that we have recorded today. I would like for us to appreciate them again together. Please go ahead and appreciate the Publicity and Advocacy Committee, ably led by Mrs. Linda Onefeli, FCIS. Now, you know, uh, when the chairman of that committee came up here, she did say that majority of the members of that committee are in Lagos. So to have this kind of um, national program in the FCT, we needed the real daughters and sons of the soil. And that was where the LOC came in. They've been appreciated earlier, but I want to mention them again very specially. Thank you for all the hard work. Uh, ably led by our own elder, Mr. Babatunde Kwelewura. Thank you so much. Uh, Mrs. Um, um, uh, she's going to forgive me now. Mrs. Toyi Bashir, ACIS. Mrs. Marilyn Eze, Mr. Dedeji Yadebi, ACIS, also the chairman of Abuja chapter. Mrs. Abeyua Obayuana. I'm sure I did better than your chairman with the pronunciation. <laughs> Mrs. Adakwa Amadi, thank you also very much for all the hard work and the leg work that went into the organization. Um, we also would like to appreciate our media partners. You've all been fantastic. You've, you've all been amazing. I'm going to start with channels, television. Uh, we also have Guardian. We have the Sun newspaper, the Leadership newspaper, This Day newspaper, Blueprint, and City News. Please, let's appreciate the gentlemen of the fourth estate of the realm. We appreciate the support you give us constantly, even uh, to project the ethos of good corporate governance uh, of which Ixan is a foremost institute. On a final note, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I would like to appreciate and specially thank the chairman of council and our own president for his leadership at all times. We can see that um, a whole lot has gone into the planning of this public lecture, and we can see also that uh, everything has turned out well because of the kind of leadership we also have. Before I leave this uh, podium, I'm looking in one direction, and I would like for you to appreciate with me the young lady you see in that corner. She's our CEO and registrar, Mrs. Ghania Atolu Shesi. 
and the entire team at the Secretariat. Well done for all the hard work you do behind the scenes and indeed in the trenches to ensure that all our programs go well. We really appreciate all that you do. Once again, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, you are all appreciated for coming to join us today and we believe that it has been a worthy time together, even as we continue in the discourse to ensure that we move our nation, Nigeria, forward. Thank you very much. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, give a round of applause to our Vice President. I'm there as it is with national honors since I was not appreciated. Please appreciate me. <laughs> Thank you very much on the lighter side. Um, before we round up with the national anthem, please, I want to first of all, once again, to thank every one of you. And most importantly, our online audience. You, ladies and gentlemen, you have been awesome. Thank you so much for staying with us throughout this program. Let me remind us that the journal is available. It's 2,000 Naira. And for those of us representing institutions like NILD, law school, CSC, please do buy as many copies as possible for your colleagues. One copy is 2,000, so you, you can then do in multiple so that uh, if you look at the journal, the, the topics are very topical. They are issues that concerns all of us and is part of Ixan's commitment in spreading governance and administration uh, knowledge across all tiers uh, in the society. So please buy your copies as well as other publications we have there that are very, very relevant. And as you are going, we want to wish you Johnny Messis and that we'll continue to build together a nation that all of us will be proud. Thank you very much. Please, can we stand up as we take the national anthem? Thank you very much. For our online audience, please hold on for a few minutes. We need to take uh, online uh, uh, pictures. Please hold on for a minute. Uh, please turn on your video so that we can take a picture, online pictures. Please turn on your video. Thank you. Yes. Yes, please turn on your video so that the picture can be taken smile look good and thank you very much for your patience for being with us throughout and for our live audience we are very very grateful thank you very much for being with us throughout this program may god bless you grant you journey mercies and may our country grow from strength to strength Please, members can purchase the stamp. Members can purchase the stamps at 3,000 naira for a sheet. Members, you can purchase the stamps outside at 3,000 naira. Thank you.
Red Truth. <laughs>